Okay, let's uh, get started. So welcome to the, uh, the SOAS uh, annual summer school. Um, this is a, um, a two and a half um, uh, day event and every year we look at a number of different uh, themes um, to examine Taiwan. We also have uh, some research training sessions. Um, now this year the, the kind of key themes we're doing uh, social movements. In fact, we've just finished two and a half days of a conference on Taiwanese social movements. Uh, and that was how I was able to put together such an um, amazing panel for, uh, for this session. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the composition of the panel in a minute. The other themes that we're covering uh, over this, um, this next two and a half days include um, education in Taiwan, history and geography education, history of Taiwan, uh, on Friday, we'll look at the politics of identity uh, and we'll look at gender politics uh, in Taiwan. Um, but today our focus is on the, the sunflower movement. Um, and I mean, it's, it's, a, um, um, it's a really interesting topic. And we've, um, we've been talking about, this last two and a half days, we've been talking about social movements since 2008. And basically, uh, every paper has, has somehow kind of ended up uh, discussing um, the, the Sunflower Movement and the way that pressures built up uh, over the last um, two presidential terms to actually culminate uh, in what we've seen in the, um, uh, in the spring of, of, uh, of this year. Um, when, I w when, the, uh, when the movement was um, erupting back in March and April, I had a number of requests uh, to organize a panel uh, on the Sunflower Movement. Um, but I felt it was a little bit too early. I felt we really needed to have eyewitnesses and people who could also look at this issue from a more kind of uh, historical comparative um, angle. Um, and let me just say a bit about what a wonderful panel I've, um, uh, we've got to look forward to uh, this afternoon. Um, our, our first speaker uh, is uh, Katie Chen. Um, ken has been following social movements in Taiwan uh, over the, um, uh, I think, let's say the last what, four or five years. Um, one way you can get at Kedi's work is through the, her blog, Participant um, uh, Observer, which looks at a range of, of, uh, of social issues. Um, and our next speaker is going to be uh, He Ming Xiu uh, from National Taiwan University. Uh, Ming Xiu is going to be talking about the um, social basis of, uh, um, of understanding this, this movement. Ming Xiu is one of the, um, the leading figures in the um, English language literature on Taiwanese social movements. He's one of these people that in, in our classes on Taiwanese social movements you can't really not read um, uh, his, his work. So again, I'm really delighted that he's, uh, he's joined us. Um, our third speaker is going to be uh, Michael Cole. Um, Michael is a former editor from the, uh, the Taipei Times. Uh, he's um, a non-resident scholar at Nottingham's China uh, Centre, and he's also the editor of a uh, quite remarkable new English language platform on understanding modern Taiwan called Thinking uh, Taiwan, which is a wonderful resource for us um, uh, in English looking at, at Taiwan. Um, our fourth speaker um, I'm, I'm, uh, is someone who probably had a huge influence on me getting involved in the study of Taiwan. Uh, I think if, if there's one person that, um, um, uh, this is uh, Fan Yun. I remember when I first um, um, went to a Taiwan Studies conference back in 1998, I, I remember Fan, Fan Yun was on the, uh, uh, on the conference, and I, and I, I definitely, uh, I'm really... <laughs> um, so that was when you were still a PhD student, I think. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, and, and I think one of the great things, both about uh, Fan Yun and some of the other speakers, is they were actually involved in the uh, Wild Lilies movement back in 1990. So they're able to kind of give us a kind of historical comparative perspective on what we're seeing um, since 2008. Um, and then after um, uh, Fan Yun, then we have a, a group presentation. Um, we have uh, Zheng Xiaota, uh, who's a former SOAS uh, student. We have Zhang Rongzhe, uh, a former uh, Essex PhD student. And we have uh, uh, Lorna uh, Kong. And um, uh, their collective title is the uh, 
let's see. The Collective of Sex Workers and Their Supporters. They actually have multiple titles. So they're going to look at this issue from an activist uh, perspective. Um, okay, and, okay. Uh, and of course, then we have the big elephant uh, in, the, uh, in the room, uh, the China factor in these protests. And uh, Xu Zijian from Academia uh, Sinica uh, will present uh, on, uh, uh, on this, uh, this topic. And then, um, if we manage, uh, the aim we have is that we'll finish our presentations in the uh, in the first two-hour session. Then we'll have a um, a, um, a final Q and A session, and uh, hopefully, our, we'll get in our final speaker, and that's uh, uh, Chowan Mei, uh, who is oh yeah at, uh, at the at the back. Chowan Mei uh, is from the sociology department in National Sun Yat-sen University in Kaohsiung. And so we particularly thought it would be important to actually bring in um, the non-Taipei-based perspective on the sunflower movement. So she'll talk about the kind of the southern angle um, of this this movement. Um, okay. So um, the aim is that each presentation will be about uh, ten minutes. Um, we'll, we'll do our best to um, uh, keep to that that kind of time. So first of all, uh, Katie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tamil, for um, inviting me. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. So um, it's a pleasure to be here at SOAS. Um, and the past two days have been really great. Um, it's, also, it's not only um, a, a, an opportunity to present um, my observation and, present, and, and do a presentation, it's also a very good opportunity for me to learn from um, all the participants. Um, on the panel. So today, um, being the first speaker, I will um, talk to you guys about the causes of the sunflower movement. And um, I will also well, um, show you photographs that I've um, taken being on the ground in Taipei following um, some of the protests leading up to the sunflower movement. And then I will, lead, um, I will leave um, the rest um, for my colleagues to explain to you. So first part of the sunflower movement, why um, the causes? Um, since about two, three years ago, there's a, um, increasing numbers of protests in Taiwan. So sunflower movements, um, for me personally, it's this umbrella movement or umbrella um, opportunity for um, activists, students, um, people who advocate for different issues um, to kind of exert or escalate um, what they've been protesting about in the past two years, but without avail, without any answers from the government. Like, for example, um, people are worried about safeguarding Taiwan's democracy. Um, they're concerned for Taiwan's sovereignty. Um, the concern of the China factor that affects people's livelihoods, um, way of life. Um, the concern for the future by young people. And most of all, it's the frustration um, by the government's irresponsiveness to different activist groups' um, demands. So what, what do they do at the end when, when what do, I guess the, the, the question that I want to pose to um, the audience is that what do you do um, after a year of following um, rules or acting within legal um, boundaries that you try to submit names to participate in public hearings so you could have your voice heard um, in the country's legislature. Um, what would you do when you continuously submit petition letters to the government, but nothing really happens? Do you escalate or do you feel deflated after a year and, um, and, and just gradually go away? But what happened in Taiwan is that the students decided that they will not go away, so they went inside of the legislature, which is um, which became the Sunflower Movement that you see right now. So this is what happens on March 30th, um, where 500,000 um, protesters swarm um, the streets of Taipei in front of the presidential um, office. And this is the amount of police that the Taiwanese government kind of advocated to try to deal with the situation. But what I want you to understand is that Sunflower Movement did not happen did not begin like this, and with, with, with tons and tons of government um, police officers. Um, it began with a series of protests, for example, demolitions of um, 
Chinese immigrants to Taiwan's home in Huaguang community were students continuously protesting, and of course the community went down. This is another photo that I took of a woman crying in front of her house. So there's student activists trying to help her. Um, the Lushan Sanatorium for leprosy um, patients, the sanatorium was built in the Japanese era, so there's both historical value of the sanatorium and also the safety reasons for the patients who still live there. Are you okay? So um, these are the activists who were kneeling and, and bowing on the streets trying to um, um, convince the government to um, stop building a train depot under the sanatorium, which um, has the possibility of having the, the mountain kind of cave on, you know, uh, um, on the sanatorium. And of course, with, with no avail, the, the bottom picture is when um, my husband and I visited the elderly patients at the sanatorium. And of course, there's the demolition of the houses in Dapu Borough in Miaoli Township um, of the county government um, to try to make way for a science park with the county's 72% of the land that was expropriated still being empty. So, um, so the county commissioner's um, um, behavior also sparked um, lots and lots of protests. This is the demolition. Um, and of course, there's the death of a um, army corporal, um, Hong Zhongxiu, which brought out um, about 20,000, um, uh, a, qu a quarter of a million um, protesters uh, on the streets um, to try to change the court martial system. Um, the group did not really follow through, but then nothing really happened. Um, the ruling administration um, party practically killed the bill. These are the people. And of course, there's the laid off worker that was sued by the government, and they've been protesting for the past decade or so. Um, what happened was the, the, the administration decided to um, file a lawsuit against them to try to get the money that they receive um, as their pension back from the government. And they were throwing shoes at government officials in, in this occasion. And then there's the ongoing Taoyuan Eritropolis. It's another land ex expropriation um, case where this is going to be the biggest land expropriation case to date in Taiwanese history. So about um, um, seven, 8,000 people will be um, dislocated, but without a, lot of, um, without a, a really concrete plan of where to put them. So all these things adding up um, with, with really no avail. Um, here comes um, the government signing the cross-strait service trade agreement um, as part of the ECFA with China. And this is actually uh, the first, very first protest of what you now see as the Sunflower Movement in front of the Executive Yuan um, by the civil, um, civil groups and students. So it's about 20 people um, compared to the March 30th, um, 500,000 people. Um, this is something. And of course, um, I was there, but not a lot of media attention. Um, so about 10 people, and you don't really see a lot of police presence there um, compared to, I think, what you guys have, have seen, a lot of um, pushing and shoving, uh, maybe a, a, the, the accusation of police beating up um, protesters. This is, this is really something um, very different. So what they did is that they, they protested, and of course, as I was saying, they submitted petition letters to government officials um, saying, can you please have... Um, create this oversight legislation to try to monitor um, economic bills or any agreement sign, um, Taiwan signs with China. So this is what they did on that day. And then they had the following um, 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 month, they had an evening concert, July 28th, um, outside of the legislature, right, with, with um, people attending. And of course, Professor speaking, this is the chair, um, chairperson of the National Taiwan University's economic department. And she's been going around giving lectures um, to people and also um, trying to lobby government officials um, to try to have oversight over this cross-trade service trade agreement. And then the students start protesting outside of the legislature. Um, it, it, it kind of, um, I was surprised that I, after the Sunflower Movement um, started, um, Government officials or, or former government officials um, in the United States ex, um, expressed that they were completely surprised by the Sunflower Movement. But if you see the play cards that was, that was held by the students, they actually 
Um, it actually says the university name and Occupy. Um, that was about a year ago. Um, so what they did was that they were trying to attend public hearings inside of the legislature. Um, they submitted a, a list of names to, um, to the legislature. Of course, they were rejected. So what the, what the students did was that they started climbing over walls of the legislature. And this is um, September 30th, two months later, again, um, convening outside of the legislature. And this time, they were saying that um, the cross-trade service trade agreement is non-transparent, and the government's behavior is unconstitutional, and they're asking for officials to resign. And again, they climbed the walls. So you see this climbing of the walls. So, um, so somehow, um, when, when um, mid-March, when the students start climbing over the wall and actually went inside of the legislature, it's, it's something um, inevitable that, that you know that that would happen. Um, <clears throat> so they were inside of the legislature, but blocked by the police. Um, then they, they move in front of the president's office um, the same day. And also, um, and, and the little, um, the female students held the um, Republic of China Constitution. Um, and of course, the police were invoking Bob Ryers against the students. And now, um, you start seeing um, leaders of the Sunflower Movement kind of emerged. So this is Wei Yang, the, the spokesperson for the Black Island Nation Youth Alliance. Um, the main student organization that, that led the Sunflower Movement. And this is Ling Feifan that you, you guys probably know already, um, who's one of the leaders inside of the OI and Professor Huang Guotang. Um, I took this photo of him and it became an internet um, sensation. And, and it earned him the nickname um, Three Buttons. <laughs> Huang, Huang San Ko. <laughs> Um, why? Because, because there's buttons not being buttoned up. <laughs> and was it a deliberate decision, do you think? It, it wasn't. We were, we were, we were outside for, um, I was following them for five hours and everybody was really sick and tired and, and really cold and it was raining and no government official would come out to speak to the students and him. So he grabbed the microphone in front of the president's off, um, office and he just started blasting with, with the, the wet shirts and hair and somehow this became a, 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 one of the very favorite photos of um, female sunflower supporters. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, um, in November 14th, um, outside of the um, 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 Straight Exchange um, Foundation, um, trying to talk about um, the the cross-trade service trade agreement and also the um, trade in goods agreement. All the agreement um, Taiwan is signing with China, again, protesting civil and, and, and you know, staying outside. And this is um, October. Um, and now you begin to see a lot of English signs um, from the protesters, but this is still kind of outside of government buildings. Continue protesting, very consistent. October 10th. Outside of, uh, it's the uh, Republic of China's National Celebration Day. They're protesting. Um, but in the meantime, the government started, um, has started to um, file charges against the protesters for kind of scaling the walls. So, um, so what happened um, when, when you did this for almost over a year and nothing happened? Right? This is um, right before Christmas, another protest about the Crossway Service Trade Agreement. In the meantime, um, the opposition actually took charge of arranging the public hearings. So the students actually participated in the public hearings now while protesting at the same time, but then still not really receiving um, a lot of answers from the government. And as I said in the beginning, it was the concern of um, democracy, democratic values, um, Taiwan sovereignty, and, and um, signing this agreement, that, that the effect that, that this agreement will have on people's lives, um, on the way of life and, and earnings and different things. So what happened that, that broke the camel's back? It was the 30 seconds. And, and I think it was really important to note that there's a bottom line, I think, for the students and people of Taiwan. It's that once you cross the line, you infringe upon democratic procedures and people and, and democratic values, this is when people start rallying up. Um, the National Chinese Party legislator, Zhang Xinzong, um, in 30 seconds, he had 
declare that the meeting has started to evaluate the cross-strait service trade agreement within 30 seconds, kind of hiding um, to the side next to the bathroom. He said that we have enough people, the review is done, passed. So that was what sparked, and I think what caused the slew of people coming into the um, LY. Right. So this is what happens when they went inside. And um, this is a photo um, of outside of the legislature um, at, on, on that day when you see um, 500,000 people outside. And you see a lot of the sign that says, you know, it's our democracy, we're protect, protecting um, our democracy and way of life. Um, so I think I'm going to stop right here, um, telling you about the causes and what happens within the year, and then my colleagues will kind of continue and tell you what happens, um, the strategy that they use and um, the impact that the, the movement have on Taiwan. Great, thank you. Just to, for those that are right later, our second speaker, Michelle from National Taiwan University. Oh, thank you. Um, so we've seen uh, wonderful pictures from Katie, so I'm going to give you some numbers, figures. Um, uh, so my talk will be understanding the base, social basis of, of the Sunflower Movement. Well, I think there are a lot of puzzles here. How can a movement that uh, continually occupy an important uh, governmental building for 24, hour, 24 days? and if we see the opinion poll during the 24 days, actually this kind of very radical, illegal act has enjoyed certain popular support. Like uh, more than 70% support its main demand, that is to reject the uh, service and trade agreement and to restart the negotiation. And more than 50% of people uh, support that action. But um, if we put that into perspective, that Taiwan is another country that is famous for uh, like uh, civil disobedience, um, uh, we have low rate of uh, low tolerance on, on disruptive protests and even uh, low rate on movement participation. So it become a huge puzzle that how come that we have this kind of uh, movement. But uh, I, I think if you look at um, my main PowerPoint is going to mix up Chinese and Thai, uh, English. I'm sorry for that. So I'm going to uh, translate that, uh, speak that in English. So. Um, but I'm looking at a, an, an opinion poll, which actually is not a regular one. It's, it's so-called as Taiwan Social Change uh, Survey, uh, which has been in place for the past 30 years, which is the most reliable social science survey data in Taiwan. And just right uh, at the end of at the end of the last year, that from September to December. And they have a, 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 a new round of on survey on, on uh, national identity. And I look at, look, it, it is published actually after the some, uh, some from our movement in April. So I look it up and you see some very interesting things from that. And you, you get a clue why this kind of movement will, has such a huge impact in Taiwan. So because the survey was uh, conducted at the end of this year and before the uh, three, three months to six months before the eruption or the protest, so you can take it as a baseline condition to understand what average people in Taiwan are thinking about. So um, I'm going to list what I found very some of the interesting features here. Uh, one of the first of all is the Taiwanization of national identity. So the, to the question whether you are Taiwanese or you are uh, Chinese or you are both, and for the per, uh, past two decades, you see the, the there's a very interesting change here. But the, 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 res, the rate of the respondents that identify themselves as Taiwanese increased from one third to almost uh, two, three thirds, from 33% to 73%. And, and, uh, and for those people who identify themselves as Chinese, from, it's from 33% to just 1.1%. So you see there's a huge reversal here that Prior to, to that, there was a predominance of Chinese identity. So I think it's quite interesting here. Um, so, and there are other questions that, for example, where, uh, what are your fatherland? And things like you were asking something about your origin. But, but you see that 67% uh, 60, uh, and 80% choose Taiwan or, or ROC, but only less than 3% choose China. And, and whether, to the question whether you are, have some attach, emotional attachment to Taiwan, and for the past 10, case, uh, 10 years, we see the number who say that they don't have emotional attachment to Taiwan decrease from like 70.8% uh, to just 5.2%. So, and also to the 
because the state, the statehood of, of Taiwan statehood actually is kind of internationally challenged. So there are a lot of questions to, to ask people about that. So to the question whether our territory, how do you define our territory? That, uh, that 10 years ago, there were 44% of people who say that our territory increased uh, not only uh, Taiwan, Penghu, Jim, Kimmen, and Ma Zhu, but also including uh, mainland China. But last year, only 6.8% has the kind of view. And I think it's, it's a, a, a great contrast to the mind just claim that actually ROC has two area. One is uh, mainland area, one is Chinese, uh, Taiwanese area. And also, um, as a question of um, one, one China consensus. So to the question whether that if we are, we are going to have economic exchange with mainland China, do you agree that Taiwan to have to accept that there is only one world China and Taiwan is part of China? This kind of consensus called 92 consensus. Uh, actually, more than three thirds of people don't say that. But actually, Ma Ying-jeou tried to promote that during his last presidential election. So you see that there is a, a very strong basis for Taiwanese identity. And also, uh, I think this identity is quite interesting because uh, this identity does not reject that uh, the cultural heritage. Actually, it's built upon that. So. Uh, the number of persons who think that we should emphasize Taiwan's indigenous culture in our edu education actually decreased from the past 10, 10 years from 96% to 79, 79, 7%. Uh, and 57% of people agreed to this statement that Taiwan's ancestor is Huang Di. Huang Di actually is a kind of mystical founding, founding myth of the so called Chinese nation. And we should carry out his blood and, 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 and history. And this is a very nationalistic statement. But you see that almost 60% of Taiwanese people agree with that. And also more than almost 82% agree that uh, as Yan Huangzi, uh, Huang, Hua Xiazi, so the like descendants of Chinese culture, that we should work hard to promote a Chinese culture. So you see that even though that uh, we see that in the, uh, the second period of the Chen shui administration, there was an effort to desynthesize Taiwan cultural, education, but most of people still think that it's not true. Uh, on the political side, we can become a uh, proudly uh, Taiwan, we can accept Taiwan as a political nation, but we still think that culturally we belong to China. I think that, that's reflected in the poll. And also this kind of uh, nation, imagery of nationalhood, I, it's called xiao I, I don't know. I don't know how to translate that. It mean, probably means small, innocent, refreshing, that very peace-like, harmless, imagery of Taiwan as a nation. So to the question whether uh, you, uh, on what aspect do you feel that our, our nation is, is you, you are proud of our nation. So the number one is our sport. It's very strange, you know, we, we, like for example, Taiwan's team never make it to the World Cup of football, but still, nevertheless, we think we are strong. Or, or it makes us people feel proud of. And science and technology and our history and literature and and, and, and are and from below you see that is military power. Of course, we, we, it's understandable, right? And diplomatic influence, economic uh, achievement, and the condition of democratic, uh, how democratic politics operates. So these are low. Uh, and you see that a nation usually, I think the traditional imagery or stranger symbol is built on hard power, like diplomacy and military strength. But actually, Taiwan Pitney's people don't think that it represents our nation. So that's why I call it Xiao Qingxing. So you see that our the people people in Taiwan tend to think that kind of soft power really represent Taiwan. Even though I, I understand it's quite crazy because soft power discourse is so fashionable in China. But what else, what do you do in China? You see that um, there are a lot of great nationalist talk like uh, It's very uh, uh, kind of uh, built on a hardcore. A uh, hot power like you got air aircraft air, air carrier, and uh, you got rocket. Uh, but it's, I think it's quite di different from Taiwan. So I can I kind of think that w w people in Taiwan really have a different <coughs> expectation for for what a nation is to for. And also uh, as for the uh, service and trade uh, agreement, I think one of the main arguments is that whether well, that is good for Taiwan. And my angel have been very persistent to argue that it is more adventurous for Taiwan, Li Da Yu I think the question can be asked people. 
how do they feel about a, a decade of closer economic integration between China and Taiwan? And I think there are main two arguments currently in Taiwan. One is the opportunity. You see that the land in mainland China is cheaper and manpower are cheaper. So we should encourage our business to go there to develop. And that's, all, that's also the rationale for, for signing the service and trade agreement because the Chinese government now allow Taiwan's service industry to, to, to have this opportunity. But on the other hand, we have a threat argument, meaning that the, uh, actually the, the, a lot of business opportunity have been like stolen from Taiwan to, to, to China, a lot of manufacturing opportunity that causing, leading to the hollowing out of Taiwan. As we see a lot of this argument. So uh, the, to the question, what do you think? Do you think that the progress in mainland China, uh, what kind of impact does that bring to you uh, as from the economic progress in mainland China? I think 60.9% uh, 60, 60 says better, and 96% uh, says it's not better, and more than 54% uh, says there is no impact. And then, then it followed by three questions. That, do you think that the Taiwanese people go to mainland China for investment or to work. Uh, you'll be saying it's not good. It's about a uh, percentage of uh, about 53.9%. And that is very high. And, but do you think that uh, Ch mainland Chinese uh, come to Taiwan for investment? Only less than 40% of people say it's not good. So you see that uh, actually the majority of people in Taiwan don't think that Chinese event is not good. I guess it's a problem, problem, probably because people are expecting more job opportunities. And to the question whether uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, mainland Chinese come to Taiwan for work, and almost three, three quarters of people say no, no, it's no good. And you see that people really are afraid of that their job opportunity will be like stolen, or they will be like uh, lose a lot of opportunity in the, in the job market. So that's the, 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 the summary of it. So, and uh, to the question, I think this question is very interesting because trade and service is, on, is economic on the one side and political on the other side. And you, you, can, you know that it's always combined together. So to the question, what will increase, which of the following factor will increase the popular support for peaceful unification with China? And the respondents are given four, four, four options. I think more than 50%, uh, actually 54% uh, of people Things that if Taiwan and mainland China are getting closer economically, that will increase in the probability of, 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 of unification. So actually, that people do perceive that there is a political impact out of economic ties. But I, I, I personally think mind you do a very, very bad job to, to help people to uh, give up this suspicion, if that is a suspicion. And then the followed by uh, like uh, mainland Chinese government uh, political uh, international status and influence increase as the rise of China, and uh, forty-four percent, and then by uh, mainland China don't recognize the sovereignty of ROC, uh, only fifty percent, and mainland China will be continually ruled by one party, a uh, communist party. That's only seventy seven percent. So you see that uh, people are really have a, actually an acute sense of a political. Uh, out, uh, uh, influence out of this trade agreement. So, so overall, you can say that people, even before the outbreak of some power movement, do feel that it is very uh, disadvantage, more at, more disadvantage than advantage for, for this. And also, you see that uh, because it is a free trade uh, service and trade agreements, also has to do with protectionism versus free trade. So you, from the opinion poll, you do see that people think, uh, are more likely to think themselves are vulnerable because of the free trade. And I think that has to do with the past economic stagnation in Taiwan. We see wage stagnation and job opportunities not increase. So there's a, a rise of the protectionist attitude. So for the past 10 years, more people agree that we should limit the import from, uh, from foreign, from internet, uh, from, from, from other country. And we should, more people think that we should ban foreigners to buy land in our country. And more people agree that the multinational corporations are doing harm to the local industry. You see this attitude uh, on the quiz. So my conclusion is that uh, 
I think we have a rise of China just neighbor, just as a neighbor to Taiwan, and more. We have a very political consent, a strong consensus on Taiwan as a nation, and this nationhood. Uh, I think it's. I can. I, I would like to call it a new Taidu, a new Taiwanese independence idea, because that is based on the existing way of life and recognized cultural heritage. That not dif it's totally different from what you have to, what you think in the in the like like uh, old people. Here in Taiwan, that insists on you have to change the name of the country, to change the, name, the, the national flag, and to speak Taiwanese only. And this national, new international imagery is based on so power, and but it's also challenging because of by the growth, growing economic tie with China. So, and there are also other other state uh, research indicating that uh, the 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 so-called peace bo peace bonus that. Uh, Helping only peace bonus because they are uh, the escalated tension in in cross strait. Uh, uh, but this new economic benefit are only enjoyed by a few people, by a, few, a, a, a minority of people. Um, you see that only those uh, new cap, new middle class, those who have skill or or employer, those with high capital, are. Uh, uh, they have more uh, frequent contact or even travel to China after the signing of ECFA in 2010. And also, the more you think that you benefit from the cross straight economic tie, you tend to vote for the pen blue parties, and less likely that these people are going to support Taiwan independence. So this, there is a growing e economic cleavage, and that is reflect on partisan identity. So, uh, so uh, we do have a political outcome out of this. So that's my survey before the sunrise. That's some proud. Okay. Uh, our third speaker, uh, Michael Cole from uh, Thinking Taiwan. Uh, Michael's going to look at this issue from uh, the angle of uh, media, new and old, and, and strategies. Right. Good afternoon. Well, thank you so much uh, to SOAS for, for having me. It's been an incredible uh, past two days and a half, and I think today should be very interesting as well. Uh, I do notice there's another uh, Taipei Times veteran in the room. Hi, Sam. Long time not see. Hao Jiu Bujian. Yeah, well, there, I'm, I'm going to look at the role, uh, first of all, the role that the media did play or did not play in, in coverage of uh, events leading to the Sunflower Movement and the actual uh, occupation and how uh, the Sunflower reacted to, uh, to that media environment. Um, it's, it's very clear. Well, first of all, I, I must say that uh, my background is more military. I've been co covering cross-strait uh, defense issues in the Taiwan Strait for about seven years and a half. Uh, but about two years and a half ago, uh, me and my, and my wife, uh, Kitty, who gave the uh, opening presentation today, uh, started doing photography, and we uh, thought that covering social protests in Taiwan were a good way to practice using cameras. Uh, lots of colors, lots of facial expressions, lots of flashy banners and all that. Uh, some action sometimes when the police is involved. So we thought that was, uh, that was quite interesting. Uh, we started with anti-media monopoly uh, sometime in the middle of 2012 and uh, quickly realized that uh, I probably needed to shift my emphasis as a journalist operating in Taiwan uh, from the purely military uh, component of the, of the cross-strait relations and start uh, looking a little more at issues of social stability or social instability. Uh, and one way of doing that was to monitor social movements and the various issues that were um, uh, animating them, if you will. Um, the interesting thing is it became very uh, quickly apparent that traditional media had very little interest or even the, the, the capacity to cover those, uh, those protests. As, as Keddie's presentation earlier showed very, very clearly, uh, initial protests tended to be very small, uh, easily ignored, non-dramatic. Uh, the protesters played by the rules. They applied for a uh, permit under the Assembly and Parade Act. They gathered on Katagalan Boulevard. They gathered outside the legislature. They showed their banners. They sang a few songs and they went home. Um, so uh, it did not give, and for those of you who have lived in Taiwan, uh, you would know fully well that the news cycle tends to be extremely short. 
Uh, and if this is not something that has sex in it or has scandal in it or violence, uh, it simply won't make the news. And uh, it became very frustrating for me because even as a journalist working for uh, the Taipei Times, I tried to pitch articles about what I believe was important uh, with regards to Taiwan's future, and the editors were like, ah, this is not really exciting, we don't have enough space, or we're going to give you 250 words to, co to cover that, that complex issue, or dump it on page four or page five, which is uh, about as, as high as the cartoons and the, uh, and the, uh, the ads. We don't have obituaries, in, in, we did not have obituaries in, in the Taipei Times, uh, otherwise they would have been right next to those. Um, then the other option for me was to pitch those articles to foreign media. Uh, I'm from Canada. I started approaching newspapers that I usually write for, and it was the same thing. Uh, very interesting, but uh, it's kind of insider baseball. Uh, you're like, okay, well, human rights in Taiwan, well, aren't they a democracy anyway, so what's the big deal, right? You look next door at China and then North Korea with their nuclear missiles, and then in the Philippines every, every week or so there's a natural catastrophe and the government does not handle that pretty well. Uh, Thailand, coup d'etat and all that. So unfortunately, Taiwan is situated in a region where, uh, yeah, it's true. I mean, human rights violations in other countries are far more serious than what's going on in Taiwan. And as I said, Taiwan, according to many people, had reached the end of history under, under Francis Fukuyama's definition, or ill-understood Ill, Ill definition. It became a democracy, ergo, everything is fine, right? But as we discussed during uh, the past two days, there's this, this notion of quality of democracy as well. It's a pendulum. Once you reach that stage, it doesn't mean that everything is fine. It can regress, it can go back. And to me, this was the big story in Taiwan. It was, for various reasons, going back in the, in my book, wrong direction. So we really paid attention. We would spend entire days before work, after work, uh, during break, on weekends, at night, after midnight, going to protests. On some days, uh, four, five protests, jump in a cab, go from one ministry to another, go back to work, uh, play tag, Kitty continues taking photos, I go do my job. Uh, but over time, what we did is build this, this composite picture of a constellation of different movements that we saw were gradually coming together. Uh, the main problem being that the government institutions were not functioning. They were no longer listening to requests from the public when they played by the rules. Uh, court orders, uh, playing, enacting different laws and all that, and calling upon society and the media, nothing worked. There was no response from the authorities, or very rarely, and the main opposition uh, party, the DPP as well, was for different reasons not playing its role as a counterforce to the, uh, the Guomindang, both in the legislature and in the executive. Uh, so what this means is that both traditional media in Taiwan and even more so overseas, because most foreign media have been pulling out of Taiwan as well for reasons, of budgetary reasons and lack of interest, uh, more and more the byline was uh, Hong Kong, was Shanghai, was Beijing. Uh, and, of course, you could be the best journalist on the face of the planet. If you are based in Hong Kong, you're, you, you, you're, you're going to miss out on a lot of things that you would only understand if you were on the ground talking with people and seeing their reactions and all that. So that was a, a major handicap as well in terms of people's ability overseas to understand what was developing uh, inside Taiwan. Uh, we saw the emergence of non-traditional Chinese language only web-based media in Taiwan that only a small segment of Taiwanese were accessing. And there were lots of photography, videos, investigative journalism, and there was follow-up as well so people could actually over time understand what the issues were and where they were going. But no uh, traditional media uh, picked up on those uh, both inside Taiwan and even less uh, among traditional media, which means that overseas people had no idea what was going on in Taiwan. Um, last year, on August 18th, the Ministry of the Interior building was occupied for 24 hours. People overseas were not aware of this. Why would people do that? Early this year, a disgruntled former Air Force uh, officer decided to crash his 35-ton truck up the steps of the presidential office. Most people did not hear about that, or if they did, they only heard the government version that he had lost a, uh, a, a abuse case uh, against his wife, 
and that he was unhappy with, with his situation. The night before, he had sent a long list of grievances pitting small individuals, ordinary people like him, against the powers that be. Those were legislators, people with political connections, big corporations and all that. And he, he named specific cases, most of which appeared in Keddie's uh, presentation earlier. Dapu demolitions, Huaguang, and other cases that he saw as injustice of the government or the powers that be against ordinary individuals in Taiwan. What this means is that on the night of uh, March 18, uh, pretty much everybody in Taiwan and outside of Taiwan was surprised. Why are 250 students, mostly students, deciding to climb the gate and occupy the uh, legislature? Well, as we saw earlier, uh, climbing gates has, has turned into a national sport in Taiwan. Uh, for those of us who, who follow those people, uh, we've seen them climb stuff over the past two years, right? This was, not, uh, this was not a surprise. And for those of us who saw the lack of uh, reaction by the government to mounting pressure from society, as, I, as we mentioned earlier, and Kitty used that term as well, for those, for those of us who followed those issues, this was inevitable. Um, I like to say I saw it coming, but I missed it by 12 hours. Uh, initially, I thought they were supposed to occupy the legislature on a Wednesday morning, uh, and it turns out they did so on a Tuesday night. Uh, and I missed, I missed the first night because I was having dinner with people from the Canadian Embassy. I could not just leave, uh, but I did show up the following morning. Uh, so what that means now, and then traditional media were then latecomers. Oh, all of a sudden, there's this occupation of legislature. Why are they doing this? So Apple Daily dispatches uh, journalists, and Liberty Times, and Taipei Times, and then foreign media, those who are still in Taiwan, also sent reporters. But there is absolutely no institutional memory. They do not know the roads that led to the Sunflower Movement and the occupation. So what do they do? Well, they turn to people like, like us and other and academics and activists who had been following those issues for a while. So people like uh, Michael Cole became very, very busy all of a sudden. Because you come home from a protest at 7 in the morning and you get a call and it's like, hello, this is Al Jazeera in Qatar. Uh, we would like to uh, interview you about uh, sunflower occupation and all that. And where does it come from? And all. So, um, which was great. I mean, it, we're more than happy to uh, articulate the grievances and explain to uh, an otherwise inattentive international community. Uh, what this also means is that the Sunflower Movement built up over the years a capacity to use imagery to counter that lack of interest. Uh, so very quickly with the Sunflower Movement, we saw a very uh, keen use of, of, of new media, uh, websites, uh, Facebook pages, Twitter, they needed a bit of help with Twitter because in Taiwan we don't tweet, we use Facebook. Uh, so Kitty had to teach me how to use Twitter as well. I've become Taiwanese. Uh, Reddit, live feeds from inside the legislature, outside the legislature, which was turning into this immense classroom slash circus slash art gallery. So it was easy, it was possible for people who were not there physically to see what was going on around the legislature. Um, and also, uh, as we saw in some placards, over the years, Taiwanese be realized that they needed to articulate their demands in English if it is to, be, to, uh, to have any traction with foreign audiences. I remember them coming to me two years ago. They're like, Michael, why some more? Why some more? Uh, we have all these protests, and it's never picked up by Reuters or AP or New York Times. Or and I told them, well, either they're not in Taiwan, and those who are, uh, well, they're taking pictures, and they don't have a clue what you're talking about. So you need to have at least some placards in English that help tell your story to an international audience. Otherwise, it's too complicated. And most people overseas, I'm sorry, they don't read Chinese. So um, they caught on to that as well. And they, uh, they went well beyond that because their website and Facebook pages was in multiple languages. They had Arabic translations of every single press release by the Sunflower Movement. Um, we had Italian. We had French. We had Russian. I don't know where they found those people. And when Al Jazeera asked me, they called me and they said, well, we would like to, to find an Arabic speaker from the Sunflower Movement. And I said, I don't think there's an Arabic speaker from the Sunflower Movement. But she said, well, well, but they have all these press releases in, in, in Arabic. Aren't there lots of Arab, Arab speakers in Taiwan? <laughs> I'm like, uh, I, I couldn't find one. I couldn't find one. But somehow they found someone who must have been studying in Saudi Arabia or something and was willing to do translations uh, pro bono, which was quite incredible. Um, so this is inside the legislature. Outside the legislature, there was a lot of action as well. Uh, in, incredible number of t young Taiwanese have DSLR cameras. Uh, middle class people, students, they have good quality cameras. They can, take, they can, they can do good 
uh, professional style photography, which plays into the creation of that imagery, and it increases the appeal of the movement as well. Um, cell phone cameras as well were quite helpful. Uh, first time I had ever seen people were using UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, I remember when uh, Lin Fei Fan had his quasi debate with Zhang Hiwa uh, outside the legislature. We're all around them on our knees and all that. There's police and government officials. And then uh, Lin Fei Fan starts talking, and we hear this. Bzzz. So everybody looks up, and we see this little helicopter floating above, and there's like Christmas lights and all that on it. And um, so we're like, oh, is, is that like the police? They now have UAVs and all that. And then after the protest and the, uh, the failure of that, of that so-called dialogue, uh, we, we saw the guy standing in the corner and he was showing his, his equipment to curious people. And it turns out he was just ordinary civilian who thought it was a good idea to, to monitor what was going on from above. Well, two days later, we had five or six UAVs flying around uh, the legislature, and I always remember Bai Lang, a former gangster, talking, and there's four or five of them just right above his head, right? So I, I believe the next, the next step should be to have some missiles on those if you want to get rid of... Uh, but we're not in Afghanistan yet, so we're Pakistan. Uh, also involvement by artists, uh, imagery, visuals, uh, music, concerts, mu music videos, animations, collage, cartoons. Uh, Taiwanese are hugely creative when it comes to these things, and now they are empowered by the internet. They are empowered by a country that enjoys very high bandwidth, so it's very easy for people to send that material. I mean, it's extraordinary. You go to the, the site the first night or the following night, there's a few tens of thousands of people outside the LY. The cell phones don't work because there's too, many, there's too much demand. So we're all blocked, basically. Two days later, all the trucks from Zhonghua Telecom and all the other uh, cell phones, Far East, and all that, they're all parked out there as well because it's a market. Now there is demand. So hey, the cell phones start working again. So you have the site surrounded by tens of thousands of people. You can access video. You can access documents, uh, which, which, which was quite uh, useful in uh, giving orders uh, when people needed to move around. But you can also learn while you're at, you're at the site, which was, uh, which was interesting. So the artwork on Jinan Road and Qingdao Road, right outside the legislature, there were more than a 1,000 uh, artifacts that were collected after students and other movements left the legislature on April 10. This is now being saved at two different centers in Taiwan for, for historical reasons. Uh, this was quite extraordinary. And the, the amount of, of uh, talent that we saw among the, uh, the organizers and the, and the followers was, was, was amazing. I was blown away by the quality and the quick reactions and the wit, the humor. Uh, there was, uh, I mean, a book could be written about the sense of humor. Uh, that we saw during the occupation. And uh, I don't think I'm funny enough to write that book, but someone should. Um, so all of this plays into the emotional appeal. Uh, the movement became much larger than the simple occupation of a building. It became, uh, it became a concert of sorts. And there were music videos uh, that were created by uh, Fire, uh, Fire X, Fire Extinguisher, a Taiwanese rock band. Uh, and they created this, this hugely moving emotional video uh, film partly inside the LY, outside the LY, and then all of a sudden we see all over the world there's different group of supporters, they gather, and they're also singing the song. It's a song in Taiwanese. So you saw footage from Japan, you saw footage from here in the UK, you saw footage from even back home in Montreal, it's like minus 35 degrees outside. So the poor guy who's trying to play drums is missing the beat all the time because it's too cold. But they're still doing it, right? So it's extraordinary. It has lots of, uh, lots of appeal. Um, what this means, the police and government took notice as well because they realized that this was extremely uh, successful use of new media by the Taiwanese, so they countered by creating their own units. Now the executive Yen, uh, the Guomindang, and the National Police Administration all have their new media units to try to counter what they say is disinformation and lies among the Taiwanese civil society. Um, and uh, now a bit more worrying is that there are signs that law enforcement would crack down on what we call citizen reporters, who again, uh, as I said, they have the means to document, they have the means to generate pictures and videos. Now they're, they're calling this incitement. So if you, as a citizen, you go to the protest site and you film what's going on, you post it on Facebook or on your website or on your blog, uh, 
in theory, under the new, the new regulations that were implemented, you could get into legal trouble for doing that because you're inciting people to what they call violence or to civil disobedience. Uh, if this had not been successful, I think the, uh, the authorities would have left them alone. So to me, this says, uh, again, as we try to find a, a proper definition of a success, uh, anything that forces the authorities to overreach and to do things that to ordinary Taiwanese are obviously evidently anti-democratic, it means that they're onto something. And this is, this is what we saw as well. Um, so once again, traditional media in Taiwan and overseas were lagging behind. Uh, history left them behind as well. Taiwan has moved on. Uh, a bit of a problem is that the non-traditional media that really helped tell the story are Chinese language only for the time being, and there's the issue of financial viability as well, especially uh, with the uh, China factor playing into advertisement revenue. Uh, my fear is that those smaller uh, media might be very quickly elbowed out, so you're once again stuck with traditional media that are not serving Taiwanese public and not serving people overseas. To this day, uh, the US, most of the, the US government, most US academics, do not understand the origins of and the reasons for the uh, emergence of the Sunflower Movement. Thank you very much. OK. Hi, Dr. Phil, uh, everybody. Uh, it's really my honor to come here to uh, share my observations and ex experiences uh, in the Sunflower Movement. And Duffy told me that uh, he, he wanted me to do some comparison between the Wild Lily Movement. Have you heard of that movement? <laughs> Could you raise your hand if you heard about the wild lily movement? Okay, half of them. So more than half. Oh, more than half. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I need to uh, do some uh, explain, uh, uh, explanation. Wild lily movement happened in 1990s and also in March. So at that time we call it March movement, and uh, it's a student movement. It's the first. Uh, uh, first uh, collectively organized uh, students' protest in Taiwan's history. And the main, uh, the, the main goal is to have a democratic congress and democracy uh, to end the so-called authoritarian period. And uh, this sunflower movement, many uh, journalists and many people try to compare it to the Wild Lily movement because it also happened in March. And also, uh, the main force, driving forces is the students. So it's also a very a grand scaled youth movement uh, happened in the 20 years. So I think it's uh, actually it's really interesting to compare the two movements, but I will do that later and then you can get a better sense about uh, what's going on in the Wild Lady movement and what's going on from my perspective uh, with the Sunflower movement. Uh, I think first of all, I, I can, uh, I should explain my role in these two movements. In the Wild Lily movement, uh, I would say that I was one of the student organizers from the very beginning to the very end. Uh, the, the Wild Lily movement uh, only lasts for one week and we gather at the I think the, 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 the most number is we gather about like 6,000 students and we sit in, in the Zhang Gaishin Memorial Hall. That's the most political square in Taiwan because it's the Zhang Gaishin Memorial Hall and in the uh, center of the Taipei city. And uh, the, the sitting in uh, continue for one week. And before, uh, at the end of the sitting in, uh, President Li Denghui, he was uh, newly elected. Uh, he agreed to meet with the student and he promised uh, he's going to have some political reform to do the, uh, I mean, uh, to respond to our appeal, okay. And um, after 24 years, I think that my role became one of the professor organizers specifically for the street classroom for democracy. And I'm going to tell you what's that. Um, I think uh, at the very beginning, just uh, probably the first or second day of the demonstration because the students and the activists already occupied the Congress. And uh, many professors, including uh, uh, Xu Sijian, he's going to talk about that later. We were quite anxious, you know, we were worried that they were, probably there won't be more students to come to join us. So we, uh, we were thinking about what can we do, and uh, then we decided that we have to initiate a new political action. 
and what we can think of is that maybe we can, we can have a boycott classes or you can call it the teaching strike because we are the professors that's what we can do uh, later on and after some discussion we figure it's better to do it in a soft way because in taiwan the uh, atmosphere was still quite conservative and we will be condemned as professors you know we ask students to go on streets so later on we call it that you know uh, it's a a street classroom for democracy. So we claim that, you know, we as professors, we will try every effort to hold our classes in the streets and uh, uh, in the streets surrounding the legislative yuan. They're mainly on the Qingdao Donglu and uh, uh, Jinan Lu. Okay. Besides the, uh, the gathering and the lectures held by the NGOs there. Okay. So over the 20 days uh, in the street classroom for democracy, we organized more than 121 lectures. The topic ranged from democracy, constitution, uh, constitutional reform, civil disobedience. Uh, we talk about China and cross-trade uh, business alliance, this kind of topic. For example, uh, Xi Zijian, right? He, he gave many lectures on that. And we also analyzed how globalization and free trade affect class migration, gender, as well as ethnic minority. And we also discuss local history and the multicultural. Besides this intellectual content, and we also have some real practice about nonviolent tactic training, because we already knew that the police might do something a series to take the students away from the street. So we need to have some preparation, not only the intellectual discussion, because it's the street demonstration. And uh, in the second phase of the classroom, we thought that it might be too, how to say, too, uh, the lectures just not enough. You know, people might feel boring, right? They have been sitting there for the whole day or accumulated day. So we need to have some discussion. It's a democracy. You need to form your own opinion. So we turn our, some of our uh, democratic classroom into the so-called, we call the district deliberation on the street. Because some of our professors, we have been uh, promoting deliberative democracy as a way to discuss public issues in Taiwan. And we thought it might be a good idea for those sitters to discuss the related issues. So we even organized, uh, we organized 11 days of deliberation on the street to, to, uh, to let the people have the chance to have informed discussion, to form their own opinions about the service and the trade agreement. So we divide the issue into the different uh, different trade, different industry, and invite the experts or insiders to talk about the uh, the crisis they were facing and how they look at the the the, the service and the trade pack. And uh, at the end of the demonstration, we even organize uh, with the how to say with the uh, with the agreement from the the decision making body. We organize an overall people's congress, Renmin Yihui to propose a people's opinion report, Renmin Yihui Yi Jian Shu, on the closed trade monitoring mechanism. Because at that time, the main uh, appeal is that, you know, we need to have a NGO's version of the closed trade monitoring mechanism, and we want the Congress to pass that before they uh, proceed the real discussion about the, the closed trade, uh, the free, the free, uh, the trade and the service and trade uh, issue. Okay, yeah. In short, I think I will say that these are the efforts came from a group of citizens that they fear they can use their uh, expertise of social science or history or street activism to help all of us to uh, better analyze the situation. Okay, it's also a self-educating and uh, mutual learning process for all of us. Uh, actually, many of us are the first time we see the issue, but we try to use uh, our discipline to analyze you know, the issue that actually our government never informed us. Okay, yeah. Uh, now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my comparison of the two movements. Uh, before that, I think I, I should talk about how did I get involved. Um, actually, on the March 18, uh, I'm seeing you talk about the March 18, the student occupied the Congress, right? Uh, uh, I, I was there. 
the reason that I was there is not because I have been long concerned about the issue. I'm concerned about the issue, but I was too occupied by other issues. But I knew that some of my NGO friends, they have been following the issue for a long time through the Facebook. And I feel it was a pity that actually just two days before March 18, only a few activists on the street, right? sitting there very lonely and I feel quite guilty so I think I should you know join them so on the March 18 uh, I was just there and they and I saw that there should be supposed to be a big gathering because they use you know lots of Facebook uh, advertisement to call for people's attention say it's a uh, it's a crucial point because the 30 second thing and I thought maybe it should be at least a few thousand people show up but you know, when I was there, and I figure it's less than 500 people. So I feel very pessimistic. So I decide maybe I should go to have dinner. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I just, actually, so I went to have dinner <laughs> nearby. <laughs> but no, I stayed there for like two hours and feel very hungry. And <laughs> I just have dinner with a, a Melinda friend and also an activist. And I went back to le legislative Yuan and knew that the students have already rushed in and occupy the Congress. So my first reaction is, how oh, wonderful. This, <laughs> the issue was saved. But this is going to be the headline of the newspaper tomorrow. Because I knew that you know, if you only have five people, probably only, even the Liberty, probably only the Liberty newspaper in Taiwan will give some you know, coverage. So it's not going to you know, work. OK, so I was just so excited. And I decided I should do something to contribute. OK, so later on, you know, I, I went there almost every day. So that's the reason that my you know, book manuscript has to be delayed. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> OK, uh, yeah. So I think for me, uh, if the students haven't rushed in the Congress, the issue would just die. None would care further after the, the pack already passed. So actually, I'm very, uh, I'm very grateful that those activists took the risky action. When the ruling party dominated the whole Congress and the opposition party being incapable, I think this is the only resort. Not all the illegal measures are illegitimate, I will say. Okay, we knew that it's illegal, okay. And uh, if we look at that 24 years ago, I would say that you know, the Wild Lady movement is a crucial point that we broke through the chain of authoritarian rule to pursue democracy. That's the issue, you know, at that time. Now we already have democracy, but it's only an electoral democracy. And this democracy is facing the crisis of being rotting away. So I would say that, you know, Taiwan is a young democracy. Now all the young democracy can be consolidated. And the many conditions will weaken the, that possibility, like the judicial, uh, we will establish a judicial system, media environment, but we lack those kind of conditions. Not to, not to mention that we even got the so-called China factor. So I would say that the social movements are the possible or, or even the only resort uh, for the civil society to safeguard our democracy. So, um, so, so, so you can say that the Wild Lily movement to push or to grasp the democracy and hope to speed, speed up the democratization and the Sunflower movement to let the democracy not be taken away or to be grasped away, okay. I will also say that uh, uh, these two movements uh, both are uh, part of the result of party values. In 1990, KMT is an authoritarian regime, while DPP has the so-called, although DPP was the uh, main leading force of the opp opposition, but at that time, DPP has the so-called Li Denghui complex, because Li Denghui is the first Taiwanese people uh, being elected as the president. So DPP uh, want to, uh, BPP didn't want to strongly pro protest to hurt the Li Denghui's chance of get, getting elected safely. However, the students didn't care who became the president. We were more concerned about the democratic procedure. So we launched a sit-in without any imagination that it might succeed, okay? And this time, the KMT again violated the democratic rule, and DPP feared to fight against it. So when opposition party, media, judicial system didn't, you know, often didn't function well, I think we can only rely on civil society to mobilize itself to safeguard the democracy we want.
Okay. And then we try to do some com the generational comparison. I would say that my generation, the wild lily generation, or you know, the people older than us, we grow up in an authoritarian era. So democracy is something we read, we read about, we heard about, but not a thing that we live in. And we even feel that it was extremely lucky that we can witness uh, democracy's arrival because we became very old, okay? However, to the younger generation, they grew up and live in democracy. They saw that they are entitled to it. So anyone wanted to take it away from them, they might got very angry because they think they're entitled to democracy. So they are willing to fight for it. So I think that's a very important difference and in a very legitimate way, okay, yeah. And this, is, this is, uh, issue is not, uh, not only about the democracy, also about their future, their rights as employee. I think they sense the opportunity uh, as well as the risk uh, of the China as a market for them. Uh, and they already knew that the differences between China and Taiwan and the cherish the freedom, democracy, and as well as the ecological environment uh, we have here in Taiwan, okay. And I would say that, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, okay, there's always some core activist and then comes the successful mobilization. Uh, the core activists of the Wild Lily Movement are the fruit of 10 years of student movement club on campus all over Taiwan. In comparison, the core activists of Sunflower Movement were more the result of street guerrilla. Uh, I think Michael analyzed that in a, uh, in his paper, okay, the street guerrilla style activism since the wild strawberry movement of 2008. I would say that the wild strawberry movement was the first social movement in Taiwan against the, uh, against the China's influence on democracy. Okay, yeah. So uh, the training ground and the ways of organization or the ways of seeing movement are quite different. I mean the. If you try to compare the wild lily uh, core activist and uh, sunflower activist, in 1990s, the campus issue, social movements, and democracy are the main issue. And students were organized along the line of campus club, and the different universities. The core activists are deeply involved. I mean, the sunflower core movement core activists, uh, they have been deeply involved in all kinds of street demonstration and uh, living in a digital era, the Facebook, or BBS in our days, Facebook, is the way that they can quickly mobilize and connect with each other. So the social media and technology does fundamentally change the way now the younger generation of activists participate in the sunflower movement. Okay, yeah. Okay, lastly I will talk about the movement impact. I think we all, uh, maybe, you, you don't know that, but you know, the, under the influence of wild lily movement, Taiwan went through the constitutional reform, and then we got the, a new and a democratic Congress, although now you know, we saw it's not functioning very well. Uh, I would say that the most important impact of the sunflower movement is the shaking up or awakening process of Taiwanese people to be aware that this is a serious issue for Taiwan's future. We have to act on that. Okay, and uh, the young people's spirit have moved many people. They already feel they are kind of, you know, numb to the older political issues in Taiwan. Okay, yeah. No matter what happened to the close trade relations next, uh, the one thing I can be sure is that the Taiwanese civil society is no longer a constant, hopefully for the better. It has become a var variable. Uh, in the future affair of the cross trade relations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Zhang Rongzhe, and this is Luna Gong Gong Youqian and Zheng Xiaota. We are from the People's Democratic Front, and we are a community of, uh, we are a political party and a community of uh, social movements, NGO as well. For example, I'm doing uh, work with a uh, sex worker, and she's uh, with uh, mig migrants. Yes. And um, I'd like to talk on, uh, in a mixed way. My, 
my English escape me all the time when I'm nervous. <laughs> so I'm going to speak half in Chinese, half in English. So I, um, I was trained as an academic uh, many years ago, and then I, I, I'm an activist now, full time. And also, I get married, have a daughter. I so talking about social message. I was just in send, sending a video tape for my daughter just right now. And uh, I've been a father of a seven-year-old uh, girl. And uh, so I'm also a citizen and nobody. So I, I I will think and talk at the same time on all this level. Um, I in in recent years in Taiwan, I think I can uh, gradually feel a, a sense of uh, anxiety in Taiwan about living in Taiwan, and this anxiety, I I will think is political in a way that um, um, there are many uh, crises. There are many things we can we we, we have to be really, uh, feel anxious about. We have um, uh, food safety problem. We have uh, we don't we don't know when if the nuclear plants will explode, and um, we have uh, uh, we have Beijing uh, when you. You are just getting off the walk, and then maybe you something happened to you. So there are lots. Of, there are elements of um, insecurity in your life. And uh, as an activist or as a regular citizen uh, in Taiwan, when something happened to you, what do you do politically? I mean, so you talk to your leader or talk to your legislator. To cancel your parking ticket, to cancel your hong uh, dan, okay, about this, about that. Your lights doesn't, your street lights doesn't work. Call your ci uh, yuan, okay. And uh, as the uh, kids, um, when there's a victim or there's some someone need help, come to us. Okay, we go to the legislator, ask him for a press conference. Uh, we lobby them to change the law. But somehow in this year, I find a um, kind of uh, frustration. It's because um, nothing seems to work anymore. Um, personally, I was uh, not afraid of uh, confrontation with the police. I was arrested for about two or three times. I can never remember. But somehow all these things doesn't work anymore. Even you have a, a violent confrontation with the police, so what? The system doesn't change at all. So for me, this um, occupation of the Li Fa Yuan is uh, kind of uh, new and uh, very symbolic to me. Because why, why Li Fa Yuan? Uh, I, I, I participated in the, the occupation of the Nei Zheng Bu as well. But I think it's still very different to occupy Li Fa Yuan. What is Li Fa Yuan? Li Fa Yuan is supposed uh, to be the, the, the place where democracy happened. It's, uh, we, we, we vote for all these uh, Li Fa Yuan, and uh, supposedly they are going to represent our interest and in making decisions. But somehow this all failed. The system doesn't work anymore. So I think the, it, it's symbolic in this way that uh, it happens in Li Fa Yuan. Okay. So it's uh, Li Fa Yuan who got occupied, not Zhong Tong Fu or any place. It's Li Fa Yuan. So I think the, this event is uh, important. In, it symbolizes for me two things. First is that um, the representative democracy in Taiwan Means uh, we 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 work for this in the past, uh, in the in the past 50 years, and then we we have it for almost 20 years. Uh, it's come to a uh, it's come to a limit. Okay. We, we have to do something for it to go on. 
And um, another another thing I find symbolic is that uh, um, for the two-party system, you know, the Kuomintang just like like dinosaurs. They just they just, just die, go die. <laughs> Kuomintang is just nasty and evil. Okay, but for the Mingjintang, they are not functioning. They are not there. Okay. At least they are not up to what people expect from an opposition party. That's why people took direct action, occupy the parliament. Wait a minute, I have a note. I forgot <laughs> the old people. Old people syndrome. Oh, and there is a show side. Well. Unique I also, I was also in the the, the Yebai. The, the wild lady. Wild lady. Old generation. I don't, I don't have this problem at all. <laughs> and what else? Mm. So I mean, uh, in general, people uh, can people feel all this uh, uncertainty, and uh, now we are in the age of. Uh, uh, globalization. Okay, so uh, a lot of not only uh, uh, the Li Fa Yun no longer place for making real decision for the people, but a lot of decision are not taking in Li Fa Yun. You however have the, all this uh, serious uh, trade, uh, this Mi Si Jiao Yi. Okay, between the partition and the the, the, the corporation. Okay, and uh, you have uh, a lot of our decision are made uh, a million miles away by a foreign corporation. Okay. A lot of decisions are not taking place in Li Fa Yuan. So Li, Li Fa Yuan lose, uh, Li Fa Yuan start to be a place for real parties, for, for, for people. Okay. And uh, it's also about, uh, I agree that this, in these elements, in this um, uh, movement, there are a lot of uh, China factor if you want it. And, um, about this, uh, we, we, we feel a sense of uh, uncertainty about this uh, neighbor, this really powerful and uh, ambitious neighbor. Okay. And uh, it's also about, um, and all these things combined together, I think uh, it affects the young people most. That's why uh, there are lots of young people showing up. In, in this recent wave of uh, social movement, they are they don't know they they kind of uh, don't know don't know what to expect from the future. I can I can say that. So um, so for me as um, as uh, activist and uh, and Zhang uh, Sandy is nobody. I usually I like to talk about strategy. So what can you do politically? Okay, there are three strategies. Okay, first, uh, feel frustrated. Go home, watch your TV, hug your wife, whatever. Okay, that's the first thing you can do. Usually, people will do things like this. We start to feel even more distant from the, the politics. Okay. I, I think the, the, this is a good strategy for me, for a regular citizen. Why do this? You, in, usually, usually, what happened for me uh, in, in represent democracy is that um, um, there are two benefits from it. First, you find someone who can to represent your interests. So it's all his responsibility. Okay, I can go home and watch TV. Okay, and then who is going and when there's something wrong, I say it's all his fault. Okay, we 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 always do things like, like this. And the strategy one is uh, I feel frustrated and go home, okay, feel distant. And the second strategy is uh, I'm looking for another um, representative, find the, the, find the next Min Jintang, find a better one. The next man is always better, is it? I'm not sure, okay. And uh, the third strategy is uh, what we are trying to do. We are, um, Ex, uh, ex, experiments. We are doing experiments about many of this, uh, many of this uh, alternative way of, of uh, direct democracy. For example, we we, we have uh, independent candidates running for uh, different seats, and. Um, mm,
Yeah, I will just leave it to Long Na. Just <laughs> 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 so probably we will use some the uh, picture and then to show you what we have done during this the uh, sunflower movement. Uh, Rongzhe already mentioned actually we before we already already practice some our political principles, some our idea. So that's why actually we are all from different kind of NGO. We are all social activity activists, but. Uh, we find out actually it, we we want to resolve the problem. Probably we need to focus on the political system. We need to change some political system. So as uh, Rongzhe mentioned about the third role, actually is uh, if if all we try to involve ourselves in the if we all have the political awareness, it means we we if we can become the we really recognize we are the master of this country probably something can a little different. So when we uh, we are one of the group of so many different kind of group outside the legislative yet. So probably you can see this picture. This is someone took this picture and put on the FB and then I was being informed after one week. This is the second day of sunflower movement. And then we just try to bring a small microphone and then try to sit on the street and then try to discuss with people what's the what's the fu ma, yeah, uh, what's the effect of fu ma. And then we listen to people's opinion and suddenly a lot of people get together. So this is how we start, yeah. And then so almost 23 days we stay there. And then we we also join different kind of activity organized by the students. And then we I think this one maybe Xiaota can a little more explain about we try to occupy a small place, mm -hmm. maybe 150, 150 meter from the legislative yuan. Yeah. We have a tent there. Yeah, yeah. For actually yeah. running for twenty four hours. Mm -hmm. And we also participate in the occupation inside mm -hmm. parliament. Yeah. And then we occupy this place for what? And then uh, actually we try to use this place to get together people. And then we try to discuss with different kind of issue related to, to, to the citizen. So, so this is one of our activity. At late night, many people pass by and then we try to discuss with them, with them why you are here, what you want to do, and then what you expect to do. Yeah. Yeah, this is our tent. Mm. Um, um, yeah, actually, it's because we think they are doing nothing inside the Li Fa Yuan. So we should just have our own Li Fa Yuan outside. And during those three weeks, we actually have like a two street space for us, for people, for people who want to say their opinion and for people who can just freely discuss on the street. That's why we set up our tent there like on the second day until the last day. Yeah. And then this is what we have done outside in our area. And then we, dis we raise a kind of topic and then we try to divide people in small group because we, we find out everything we need to, we need to let everyone have the, have the chance to speak out. To, uh, this may probably you can call it a kind of informed discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we do we, we quite do a lot about this one. Mm. Mm. And this is disabled people. Yeah. Yeah. So who participate us actually they are people from different different kind of group. Also the, I, I need to say majority they are from some underprivileged. For for example, Zi Wen, the the man on the right, actually he cannot go in. But at the end, he he did went into to Li Fa Yuan. But f what if he um he won the election? There's you know the Li Fa Yuan is not for this kind of person. There's no so for us it's like we yeah. should just have our own Li Fa Yuan on the street. And if you want to discuss things, then you can come here and you can talk about your own interests and what 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 kind of law you want and what is um, Fu Mao affects you and what do you think you really want to change. So this is why I think the open, this is I think um, the open space is a very good um, 
a very good opportunity for, for a group like us because we can really, like during those three weeks, we were really on the street and just talk to people. And because of the Sunflower movement, people just come and we can talk to people easily. And for me, it's like, because we've been doing social, social movement, movement for so long and sometimes normally it's like we go to a place and try to talk to people. But during those three weeks, like people just come and talk and this all people, about this politics people, yeah, and they are nurse. all about what they, they want to change. These two, they are the, from the nurse union. Yeah, from the nurse union and also we try to discuss about why they want to form a union. Yeah, what's the benefit as a patient or as a nurse? Yeah, so we try to link this kind of discussion. And then, uh, of course, we also join a big event. Yeah, mm. because the students or a, a lot of NGO maybe later, Abi maybe will mention about that one, or Huamei will mention about that one, because they do organize so many events. We, are, we also participate and be invited, so this is some our, one of our group, they participate in this. And then <coughs> I think, um, I need to say they are a lot of people, it's not just only students during the Sunflower Movement. And then there are so many people uh, this is a letter, if you see on your left side, this is a letter made by a worker. He is a cleaner. He just came to participate our assembly on March 28. And then he just gave us a piece of paper. They asked us to try to announce for him, because he said he just only graduated from an elementary school. So he never holding a microphone before. So she, he fear shame and he don't want to go in front to make a speech. So he asked us try to try to speak out. For, yeah. for him. Yeah. So so and then we encourage them to hold microphone by himself. So that's why finally everyone encouraged him. So that's why finally this is him that he holding microphone. And on his letter he's mentioned about everyone. We all have our imagination how to run this country. So he also have his own idea, even he is a worker. So he tried to explain his idea and then he want to encourage everyone to participate to facing the political change. And then, uh, so after that day, he participate our assembly every day after his work. And then after two weeks participation, and then the last night, we encourage him to become a host of our to assembly, host mm. yeah, to host our discussion. And then actually he also afraid, but we try to encourage him and then he made his decision. So he did it. So I think for us, this is very important yeah, for us because we do encourage people and then step by step, if you already have this kind of design, and then you also feel a lot of frustration or disappointment, you need to take some action. So, Buding Dage is a very, very good example. Yeah. Okay. So, three activities. And then, of course, you can see, and this is Xiao Tai in the middle. Oh. The young generation inside the legislative, yeah, the old generation always outside. <laughs> uh, I, for me, like, um, actually, I was on that night, the. Uh, when they when they ran into the Li Fa Yuan, I was writing a rewriting essay to SOA. Oh, oh. <laughs> so I, so I was working until 3 a.m. and then I said, <laughs> um, um, and the second day uh, I went inside to Li Fa Yuan and during the weekend they, they asked us to go uh, support them because they were quite afraid. The students inside they were quite afraid because it was the, with the first weekend, so they think the police is going to like try to break in, uh, and they think we are more experiment. Like because I I was um, my first big protest was in Hong Kong, two thousand five, the NTWTO one. So we were beat beat by the Hong Kong police, and I was in the detention jail for several days. But I was like, oh, okay, I think it's quite different because I was quite worried inside the leaf area. What if the police really come inside? I was like, okay, what I was, what I tried to do is just like waking people up and just like saying things. But I have a great story from inside because I was um, 
to I was talking to a young 19 years old boy he's like he was so angry and he said like it's all their fault. I was like, huh? Whose fault? He's like, it's all their fault. Like the older generation fault. It's uh, the blue and the green. It's all their fault. I was like, okay. And he's like, because they did it so bad, and I have to be here, and I was trying to like fix the bad result from their action. I was like, yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Like, so what are you going to do? I I was like, oh, so okay, we were here. And what's your next step? Mm. If you already knew this, this is this is something you need to do, and you already like think it's their fault, but you also you want to take your responsibility mm. for that and do something more. Mm. Um, so after two hours chatting and smoking and eating, uh, the next morning he came to me and he said, "I did something after talking to you." He said he went to like the DPP the front door mm. and talked to one DPP legislator, and he he told him, Wei Yuan, like legislator Wei Yuan, it's your fault. And and the and the DPP Wei Yuan said, what? <laughs> and and then he said, I told you it's your fault. And the Wei Yuan said, no, it's not my fault. It's the KMT's fault. <laughs> and then he's like, no, it's your fault. <laughs> and that's the end of the conversation. For me, it's like the, you know, the, for me, it's like the, the young generation already know what's the problem and then trying to do something. But for the Wei Yuan and for the people who are still in that system, mm. they can easily say, it's not my, it's not, not, my, my, not, not, not my, my problem, problem. it's his problem. So they can just like throw in this bulb in mm. between them. They don't, and this game is so familiar for them. It's, you know, they feel safe. And this whole system is function and working for their own interests. For me, it's like, okay, like, but still, like, after Sunflower Movement, we still need to face this question, like, what should we do next? And what else more can we do? You, you find you have to come to the, the problem, who is the real master of the, the, the country, okay? But in usually, in general, in the represent democracy, we are only ma ma master for one day. In the voting day, we are master. And then we are slave for the next four years, okay? <laughs> so it's wrong. Okay, we are in yeah. our presentation. This is from our perspective. Yeah, yeah. thank and you. Okay. I do know, like, right. during those we can. I think it's the 29th of March here. There, I think in London there's also a small protest or small activities. I, I, we will hope like in the next hour we can hear more from you, like who, who may might went there. Yeah. Oh, and this is the gift from us. It's uh, it's Yang Bing. Okay, so we uh, so we move to our. Um, last but least uh, uh, kind of uh, speaker, Professor Xu uh, Zijian from uh, Academia Sinica. And Xu Zijian is going to talk about a, um, a topic that uh, uh, a lot of us have touched upon, and that's the China factor in, the, uh, in these protests. Okay, uh, over to you, Zijian. Okay, thank you. Uh, I apologize uh, for not being able to prepare a PowerPoint. But uh, today, basically, I'm going to talk about uh, our four talking points, uh, just to elaborate in, in advance. The first is something that uh, uh, some of our colleagues have mentioned already, that the Sunflower Movement is not a single event. It's event after a, a, a long process of accumulation uh, of multiple social uh, movements expressing people's uh, a long time dissatisfaction. Uh, and the, th the second point is there are three, I think, there are three major contacts in this sunflower movement, and, and China factor is one of it, one, one of them. Uh, and the third, after uh, elaborating these three contexts, I would like to say the China factor amplifies the other two contexts. I'll elaborate that. And then lastly, the last point is the impact of China factor after the movement to the Taiwanese society 
and particularly civil society organizations. Okay. <clears throat> so very quickly uh, about the first point, as Michael and uh, 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 Caddy has mentioned uh, through their uh, uh, presentation, that the, the sunflower movement is, cannot be seen as a single event. Uh, you know, it's, it's a long process of accumulation of frustration, anger, and the feeling of, you know, that it's necessary to take some uh, further or move uh, further action or escalation of our confrontation to the non-responsive government. So this is a, there is a very strong feeling of this. I have interviewed many civil society organizations. And they have the feeling that they have stepped to the, the edge of a cliff. That if we do, do not take any further action, that will be the end of Taiwan, something like that. OK? So very strong feeling like this. OK, and then the second part is three major contacts of, uh, of the, the Sunflower Movement. The three major contacts, is, first is defending democracy. Second is anti-globalization. And the third is the China factor. Okay, defending democracy, I think, is very. I think it's the most conspicuous factor that motivate people, particularly young students, and a lot of them are high school students. The high school is during the midterm, you know. A lot of high school students from southern Taiwan, eastern Taiwan, they didn't tell their mom and parents this is take a train, come to Taipei, and they, their parents came to Taipei to find them. <laughs> a lot of cases like this, right? A lot. You know, and we have to try to help those parents. I don't know how to help them, but, but it happens a lot. Because these high school students think the 30-second scenario is really ridiculous. It's unbearable. How can things like this happen? OK, there's a very strong feeling that the, 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 the government is destroying our democracy. Um, and uh, uh, the also, uh, during the, the there was a, a series uh, 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 about two weeks or, or one week of uh, uh, public hearing uh, uh, before this incident. And the public hearing itself, the whole process, uh, it's a joke. Because, of course, a lot of NGOs or scholars were invited to express their opinions. But eventually, we found that the, the, the ruling party, the KMT, did not take any point into consideration. So the whole thing went for no, to, to no avail. So we thought that that's a joke. Um, and also, there is a very important background that uh, we, we, we think should bring into your notice. That is, uh, in last year, 2013, there was a very important incident called we called the September power struggle. The September power struggle is that the President Ma ying started a, a power struggle against uh, uh, the chairman of the legislative yuan. Uh, Accusing him of, I forgot the, what was the accusation. Uh, accusing of him of colluding with, huh? Colluding with opposition on some, uh, not bribing, but, but this is affecting a, a, a judicial case, something like that, right? Yeah. But the evidence came from, uh, 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 Illegal, illegal wiretapping. Uh, illegal wiretapping. Yeah, illegal wiretapping. And uh, the, the government official just made a report. The, the report itself is illegal. And the president accept, accepted him and used this as, as the evidence to accuse the, the chairman of le legislative yet. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, this is nothing more than power struggle. But eventually, this case was brought to the, to the, to the court. And... Uh, uh, the, the mind your sides fell. So, I mean, this angers a lot of people, too. We thought that the president himself is, is doing great damage to our democratic system. Uh, all these things undermine the government's legitimacy. Um, and of course, uh, as said by our colleagues, we have accumulated frustration with legislative yuan uh, as a political institution, too particularly the, the uh, NGOs that uh, have made multiple appeals for various reasons uh, to affect the legislation, but all came to no avail. So that is the defending democracy element. The second element is anti-globalization. 
A lot of the groups involved in this movement uh, came because uh, uh, we, we were, we're not signing this, this is called a uh, free trade agreement. Uh, no, 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 I'm sorry, service trade agreement with mainland China. And this, this is negotiated because previously we already have a ECFA, economic, uh, economic free, what is it, a framework? Cooperation frame, economic cooperation framework, framework. agreement. Agreement uh, across the strait. So according to that framework, we're supposed to talk about a service or a commodity free trade agreement. Um, uh, but uh, there, there, there are already many, group, uh, many uh, organizations in Taiwan opposing not only a, a free trade agreement with mainland China, but free trade agreement with any country, because uh, they thought that this will, uh, this will worsen the many conditions, such as salary condition, such as social disparity, social injustice, will lower the welfare level, uh, or, or, or will uh, bring in environmental deterioration, or lost jobs, things like this. So a lot of the groups uh, joined this movement because of that, not because of sometimes they don't have strong feeling against China, per se, but they are against uh, 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 the globalization. Uh, the third is, of course, the anti-China uh, reason. But there, there, are, there are also different levels of anti-China uh, sentiment. The first of all is that we feel a uh, further economic relationship with China uh, may, threaten, may threaten the Taiwan's uh, sovereignty. Uh, this is the first. The second is about the threat to Taiwan's freedom of speech, freedom of everything, and human rights because of the bad record of Chinese human rights itself. Uh, the third is the economic threat, that the Chinese investment uh, is uh, they are a strong competitor. So uh, a, a closer economic ties may bring not only or not only or not economic opportunity but opportunity but economic threat. And uh, the, the last is that uh, uh, it may cause uh, stolen jobs or, or, or stolen human resources, things like that. Um, so there are these three different contexts, but these three contexts may, over, uh, uh, may interact with each other. Uh, for, for some groups, they may come for all of them. For some groups, may come from, for certain two or certain one uh, uh, factor. But the, uh, the most important point I would like to raise is that the China factor itself, the, or, the, or the, the, the influence of the China, uh, amplifies the effect of the other two factors. This is the most important thing that I found. Uh, first of all, the China factor amplifies the threat to democracy uh, by the Manchu administration through the process of uh, the, the negotiation of uh, 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 service trade agreement. First of all, service trade agreement was signed in June last year. But uh, it took everyone by surprise because the Biden administration didn't, uh, didn't inform anyone in advance. All of a sudden, he, they, they, they declare, oh, the agreement is signed. And everyone says, what? You didn't tell us. You know, not even to the KMT legislators. But actually, <clears throat> one government official told me while I was chatting with her. She said, well, I have to be honest with you, Professor Xu, in advance, we did consult some of our own party legislators. They did offer some opinions on the agreement itself, but eventually nothing was changed after the negotiations. So even the KMT legislators, they were angry. They were furious. They thought Mind Joe did not answer their question at all. He was too arrogant. So that is the reason why in legislative Yuan, there was a bipartisan agreement uh, solution. That the, the, the act itself, that the agreement itself, has to be reviewed and passed by, uh, uh, by the consent. Uh, otherwise, it will not be put into effect. Because according to the current law, it does not have to have the consent of the legislative Yuan, as long as the legislative union does not have reviewing opinion within 30 days. If the legislative union cannot reach a consent 
on amending the articles, the agreement will go into effect automatically. That's the current law. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Okay, so, but, but now the KMT joined the DPP to have a resolution that it has to be reviewed and passed uh, bipartisan. So uh, this proves that the, 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 the passing or the signature, the, the, the negotiation itself lacks legitimacy, not only for the opposition, but also for the, for the KMT legislators. Um, and of course, this ridiculous scenario of 30 second pass, passing of the, of the agreement angers everyone, every reasonable human being. Okay, <laughs> and, 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 and everyone has this perception that my hasty approach of passing this service trade agreement, wh why? Why did he do this in this way? Because we thought he would like to do this in exchange for a chance to meet with Xi Jinping, okay? For his personal reason. I mean, so the, that, we are already very angry. <laughs> and then, you know, he was, he was proposing this to Xi Jinping time and time again. Recently, he did it again, okay? So how can we not connect these two things together? Um, and then um, we, have, we already have China's threat to Taiwan's freedom, for example, freedom of speech. Uh, we had a very important uh, move, social movement that is the anti-media monopoly uh, movement. Uh, because one Chinese, uh, Taiwanese businessman who had very big investment in mainland China, he already had a, a, a newspaper in Taiwan. Uh, we have only four, maybe four major newspapers, five new major newspapers in Taiwan, and he had already one. So there is an uh, originally invested by the uh, Hong Kong uh, a businessman. It's called the Apple Daily. And the Hong Kong businessman wanted to sell this newspaper. And this Mr. Tsai, he wanted to buy that. So we thought, we only have five, and you have, you're going to have two of them. You know, this is too much. This is monopoly. And so we protest to the government. Or eventually, uh, uh, we, pressure, we exert pressure to the government. The government did not allow uh, uh, this, uh, this, this joint venture. So. Uh, the, the, the shadow of the threat of uh, the Chinese threat to our freedom of speech is already there. Um, and um, a lot of uh, people, we, we think that, you know, after we, we thought we have torn down authoritarianism in Taiwan for about 30 years. But now it's, it's new ghost of authoritarianism. A coalition of KMT plus CCP is coming back to restore a new authoritarian rule in Taiwan. This is unbearable. So this is also um, how China Factor amplifies the threat to Taiwan's democracy. The China Factor also amplifies the threat, to, uh, the threat of globalization. Uh, first of all, Ma Ying-jeou administration, particularly in the second term, has adopted hyper-developmentalism, -develop uh, a line of policy in Taiwan. So the government is very active in grabbing the land. So we have this land conscription, anti-land conscription movement, and uh, uh, strengthening or, or opening the avenue for monopoly, uh, uh, and the deterioration of salary and working conditions, things like this. Uh, and, uh, and Usually, it's perceived that the, 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 the service trade agreement will also open the door uh, for not only, for not only uh, uh, the Chinese investment, but also the Taiwanese business itself uh, uh, to strengthen their monopoly. For example, service trade agreement, we think the most important sector uh, that, that, that push forward this legislation in Taiwan are banking. Okay, because Taiwanese banks are much more efficient, I have to say, business-wise, much more efficient than the Chinese ones uh, in providing services, various kinds of services, and more internationalized standard services. So uh, the, the Taiwanese banking, they're very eager to open new branches in mainland China. Actually, they have already do. 
They're, they have already opened, uh, already done some like this, in, in, but it's not legal yet. So they want to legalize this. So they, they think service trade agreement will do, uh, do them a uh, favor. But, but um, uh, other service uh, uh, business like uh, beauty salon, now we have some major uh, uh, beauty salon uh, corporations in Taiwan. They themselves actually right now exploit the student labor very much. Uh, they are also behind the scene, uh, pushing forward a service trade agreement. So uh, they are not Chinese investment, but they are aiming at the Chinese market. So China factor does not, does not have to come directly from Chinese investment. China factor is, is the influence because of China. Okay. Uh, um, and also, we are very, very afraid that the large, usually when the Chinese investment comes, it usually comes in a large scale corporation. So we are also very afraid that this large scale corporation uh, may form some kind of monopoly or, or uh, uh, lower our welfare, welfare standard. Um, uh, lastly, let me talk about uh, the impact of this movement. Uh, through this movement, of the China factor on um, Taiwanese society. First of all, I have to say, uh, through this movement, through this sunflower movement, a lot of civil society organizations, uh, originally it's difficult for us to work together, but through this movement, we form some kind of uh, coalition or alliance, uh, willingly or unwillingly. You know, we are forced to work together to defend ourselves. Um, I have to I have to say this is uh, this is magical. <laughs> it's magical, but because usually civil society organization or NGOs we we focus on our own issue, right? Policy issue, and that will keeps us very busy already, right? Usually we don't have time to pay attention to other people, but right now a broader context forces us to work together. That also emancipates us from our narrow mindedness to a broader pro political context. China factors being one of them. And I think global, pol economic globalization is another. Okay, so now I think uh, NGOs in Taiwan are much more open-minded and we have to, we're, for, we're also forced to politicize ourselves, to be more willing to uh, get involved in, in uh, you know, border context of politics. Um, another, another thing is that uh, uh, the, the, the civil society organization in Taiwan used to be, as I said, very narrow-minded, but right now, a lot, of, a lot of NGOs right now are more alert to the influence of China factor and more uh, aware of it, more alert to it. Um, so in that sense, uh, the, the NGOs are much more easier to mobilize ourselves to, uh, to help each other uh, in a broader context of issue. Um, yeah, I think I just finished here. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, the Sunflower Movement. One of the things we've discovered from some of our discussions uh, over the last couple of days is there's actually quite, often quite significant uh, regional variation in the way some of these social movements in Taiwan have been operating. Um, so we thought it'd be particularly useful to um, get the southern perspective uh, from um, uh, Cho Yubin and, and Cho Huamei. Um, I should mention that um, uh, Cho Yubin brings the perspective even further south because Cho Yubin is based in um, Pindong. Uh, Pindong University of <laughs> Education. Um, and one of the things I, I noticed from uh, keeping an eye on their, on their Facebook was how active they were in terms of arranging uh, students to come from, uh, from Gaoshan up, up to Taipei. Um, so, um, I, know I, should, I, should also, I should also say that uh, both the, uh, the Cho's uh, have a very close uh, UK link. They both did their PhDs at the University of uh, Essex. Essex. Oh, so we actually have um, three University of Essex. Uh, no, uh, yeah. Okay, so, uh, and what we'll do is, after this uh, very brief uh, Southern presentation, then we'll move into the, uh, the Q&A uh, session. So, Yubin, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, first, I want to correct Actually, oh. Pindong is northern than Kaohsiung. Oh, Check okay. the map. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Slide, <laughs> slightly northern. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. But you've got to go through Gosha to get a pingle. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. actually toward yeah. east. Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. Like Si Jian said, but this this movement is kind of magical. Imagine some something you know incredible happen. For example, these two pictures. The first. It's Zhanghua Sifan Dashi. People from Taiwan, then you will know. The normal university is the most conservative university in Taiwan. Sometimes even conservative than the military university. But you can see. And the Zhanghua Sifan Dashi University is the, is the one of the most conservative ones. So the students will come out. And then the second is the People want to donate the money on the Jinan Jinan Lu. Um, this happened every day, and uh, let alone when the campaign started using online donations, the endless money we just keep going in. Even in the south, um, some an NGO um, help to you know receive the donation from ordinary people. And in, in two weeks' time, we got more than 2.5 million Taiwanese dollars uh, to help the students who don't have money to buy the ticket to Taipei. And then we just keep using, using this money, sending all the students up to Taipei. So actually, this is not only a student. This is a, student, a movement of, of, of society, the whole society. And yeah, not only students. Outside, you can see many NGOs. This is all the flags from different non-government organizations or social movement organizations. And uh, like Sujian said, most of them actually, in the past, they knew each other, but seldom you know, work together closely. But in that three weeks, they all work together closely. And uh, afterwards, still going on. OK. Um, I want to say something about um, what happened in Kaohsiung. Actually, this is quite uh, maybe brother, because I took it when we clashed with police. It happened in on I think it was um, 20th of July, 2003. Um, Jiang Yihua. You know, have a special you know, public meetings, Shuo Ming Hui, 13, yeah, in Kaohsiung. And the, all the NGOs and students came to the end. Uh, yeah, so I don't have the opportunity to properly take a photo. Yeah. So, um, so before um, Mar um, eight, eight, 18th of March, actually, um, many things did happen. This the. Um, that's in, in November, I think. It's held by the uh, trade union federations in Kaohsiung about the Fu Mao. So and you can see Lai Zhongqiang, lawyer, was there. And this is another president of the union federation in Kaohsiung who went to Taipei to attend the, the uh, protest in front of the presidential house. And this is in the Christmas time in Kaohsiung. I think this is the first march against around Taiwan. It happened in Kaohsiung. But only 200 people appeared. So this is what happened before. And when the, um, the occupation happened, the students from the south, you know, uh, of course, were so eagerly to, to, to go up to Taipei. And so, according to our statistics, I think more than 60 buses, you know, I think more than 60, 60 bus in Kaohsiung solely. So if you count from Jiayi, Tainan, and Pindong, probably more than 100, sent um, in different times, often um, in, in, the, in the midnight. Because we encourage them to, to took bus um, at, at 10 o'clock in the evening. So that they can arrive 
in Taipei at Taipei around midnight, two or three o'clock, which would be the most dangerous moment of a day because most students in, who live in Taipei maybe go home to sleep. So the people around, surrounded by the digital division, um, around the digital division, will become less. So as uh, we encourage the students in the south to go go up at that moment. So they call midnight bus. And in Kaohsiung, it also happened that, um, on, I think it's the third day of the campaign. Yeah, some people just post post a message say let's get get together at the Meidao Jie Yun Zhan at 7 o'clock in the evening. And when, in the beginning, there's probably dozens of people. But it ended up with more than 4,000 people in that um, MRT station. And this is the first public meeting outside Taipei. And then more and more, this was in at the Central Park in Kaohsiung. And next day in Bo E Yun Te in Kaohsiung. <coughs> and then to the KMT Kaohsiung branch. And not only in Kaohsiung, but also in Tainan and Jia Yi. You know, people just gathering together. Yeah. In, in Tainan, it happened the same stories. You know, just a couple of people you know, who post a message on Facebook, say two days later, let's meet, let's meet up at the Chengda, Chenggong Daxue, Nanrong Guangchang. And then turn out 4,000 people show up. So it shows that more and more people um, on the ground at the grassroots grass level um, are trying to get involved in this campaign, especially for those who couldn't go up, go to Taipei. And also, this is the first strike you know, voting, voted by students to, to have strike. This is a sociology department at Zhongshan University. And this is a teacher, including Chou Mei. They later complained that actually strike is more tired than <laughs> normal time. <laughs> yeah. Because they have, still have to arrange you know, activities through the daytime, sometimes even in nighttime. So actually quite tired. <laughs> yeah. And of course, the students in the south, um, in different times, went to Taipei. Um, and some of them come back, you know, back and forth several times. Um, of course, they, f they have faced some frustration because you know the decision-making system in this movement is kind of unique, okay? <laughs> Which is different from the white lady movement because some 24 years ago, we, have, we, we, we had a demonstration on a square, which is, you know, very convenient for, for everything. But this time, the main force were in uh, Yichang. And then, Jinan Lu, there is a gathering there. And uh, in Qingdao Donglu, another one. And in front of the Li Fa Yuan, another, another one. So actually, you've got four, you know, four systems is going on. So some students actually feel frustrated because when they were there, they couldn't do anything. What they can do is just, you know, sitting there and uh, do nothing. They even could get the opportunity to show their support or they could speak up their voice. So, for example, the Zhongzheng Daxue students, they, um, in, in one day before, before Xing Zheng Yuan, they, they you know, mobilized more than 300 students and uh, sending more than 10 coaches to Taipei. But after sleeping one night, they decided to withdraw back to the campus and then start to launch the campaigns on the campus. So it becomes amazing. You can see um, the people gathering at the campus and singing Dao Yu Tian Guang. They're starting from them. <laughs> okay. 
and uh, including students from Zhongzheng Daxue, Zhongshan Daxue, many in South, they start to get alive, alive together. So they call themselves Minzu Hei Chao, and uh, attending the big demonstrations on 30th of March. And uh, I think one particular thing I want to highlight is that they went Taipei in the name of the Alliance of Students and Workers, Gongxue Lianhe, which they took bus with workers, with the union members, um, to Taipei together. Okay, so this was happened in the, at the moment. <coughs> And people in Kaohsiung who couldn't go up to Taipei, they start to think, what can we do locally? So for example, some teachers and uh, parents, they say, maybe you can have a conference. Because that was um, in the beginning of April, which is near Qingmingjie. OK, though the children sitting in Taipei couldn't go back to, to Saomu. OK. <laughs> so they used these you know, holidays to to ask all the legislators to persuade President Ma doing something good, please. Let our kids go home, and uh, we can say something to and our ancestors. So this is the conference, what they do, what they did. And then another group, of, um, including the female uh, scholars and the local um, uh, feminist uh, uh, organizations, they decided to launch a campaign called Lu Guo, Lu Guo of KMT's legislators. So they, they, they ask this KMT legislator have to do something, have to sign an uh, agreement to actually to be against the Mind Zhou. But of course, nobody really signed it. But it attracted a lot of people. For example, this campaign to Lin Guo Zheng's food uh, 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 office in Kaohsiung, it attracted, I think, around 1,000 people to, to, to go there. And uh, so I think the people local start to think they can do, really do something a local. And, uh, but the only pity thing is that there are too few KMT legislators in Kaohsiung. So only two. So they did it this. And uh, another another one, twice. Um, yeah. So on the last day of the campaign in Kaohsiung, we also have a demonstration just at the same time in cultural center. So the local students um, they decided not to go to Taipei to attend the, the final meetings gathering. And they decided to, to, to hold a, a, a public meeting local. So they call it Zai Di Zha Gen Min Zhu Hui Chang. So different civil organizations gathering there together. And uh, afterwards, they even had a locally Da Chang Hua Yun Dong. Xiang Chang Hua, that's the locally. Uh, yeah. Okay, this is the unofficial, un, un, un <laughs> but more exciting public meetings afterwards. It held until May 9. So this is a problem. I, I just want to show you some pictures of what happened in the South. And, uh, but I think the story won't, won't end here, because I think uh, one of the big achievements of this Sunflower Movement is that we can see the really activated civil society in anywhere, in anywhere. Even, I mean, the, the friends in Penghu in the remote islands, they think that the, the people start are more concerned than ever about the public issues. And uh, so this is what happened just right after the end of the Sunflower Movement, this anti-nuclear movement. So this was happening in, Gao, in Kaohsiung. And uh, mo many ordinary people, Su Ren, in, involved in that. And uh, for example, some young couples or mothers, they bring their children to read points or read books on the station, MRT, and uh, try to alert people uh, how dangerous the, the nuclear um, power is. So this happened through the end of the anti-nuclear campaign. 
And uh, now, I think, uh, I, as far as I know, the people in, 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 in South, now many of them have been involving in the campaign against the free economic processing zone project, uh, the movement. So I think this is very important and a big achievement um, of, of, of the Sunflower Movement. Because these kind of issues, which is according to public, public, uh, government, which is good for the uh, economy, right? In the past, these kind of issues were you know, faced a, a big against uh, you know, from the society. But now, the society will start to think, um, what do you say, Li Da Yu Bi? I mean, the good is better, and the, the, the benefit from this project. But the benefit, benefit to whom and who will be harmed? This kind of question start going to the mind of society. I think this is a good and a very big achievement of the, this movement. So I will stop here. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Well, I, I can give it a, I can give it a shot. I mean, the next step, the most important step in my book is that they have to stay alive. They cannot afford to disappear. Uh, they need to keep the issue alive. If the government goes back on its quasi promise, there needs to be consequences again. Now, the current phase is their uh, Black Island Nation Youth Alliance and others are going around Taiwan and they're holding information sessions. So this is a form of recruitment right now. Uh, they're trying to generate new leadership, to bring new blood, and keep that issue alive, educate uh, ordinary Taiwanese about, about those issues. Um, is that sufficient? Uh, probably, I, I would say the next step has to be, uh, they need to find a way to bridge activism opposition uh, with uh, those in government or within the institution who are able to effect actual political change. Uh, right now, what I'm seeing is that the, the two entities are not, no longer talking to one another. Um, even the DPP has been alienated from social movements because the, the social movements have lost trust in the ability of the DPP to act as a counterweight. Someone somewhere needs to find a way to connect those two institutions again. Uh, if for some reason the DPP fails to achieve that, which is not impossible, uh, maybe the next step is to see the emergence of a third force. Uh, so far, I mean, there are rumors that, uh, and I believe those are completely unfounded, that uh, Lin Feifan and Sen Weiting did what they did because they have political aspirations. Uh, in my book, this is not the case. I've been following these people for a while. Uh, but maybe someone from that group will eventually have to make that leap and say, you know what, I know politics is dirty, but someone has to do it. Mm -hmm. Because if nobody does it, 
we're constantly going to be in that you know two system nation where you're constantly you're you're perpetually divided, right? So you need either you need it was said yesterday at the conference you need to bring government institutions closer to society or society itself has to uh, move closer to government institutions and become part of it and try to change them from from the inside. So I guess it, as a general answer to a general question that would that would be my uh, my response. Anyone else want to respond on that? What next point? Yes. May I briefly uh, respond to that question? That a lot, a lot of things uh, need to be done. Uh, one of them is um, to start a, a another long-term movement of constitutional reform. Uh, what Michael just said, a new third political force. I think uh, the appearance of uh, uh, the new third political force depends on to what extent we can successfully change the rule of the game of political system in Taiwan. To be able to do that, we need amend a lot of laws and also, if possible, the constitution. My idea and the idea of many of my friends in Taiwan is to change the current, what I call non-accountable presidentialism particularly the second term, to a multi-party cabinet system, which we think suits Taiwan better. That's a short answer. Yes, um, I'm just uh, trying to uh, catch up with uh, the, the, the strategy I'm talking about. Um, I remember there is a speech that uh, Chen Weiting gave when the, the, the whole demonstration is going over. He come out and say... 7th of April, and that on that day they announced like they're going to end yeah. that uh, mm -hmm. end the occupation. occupation. Yeah. And they, they gave a speech on Qingdao, because there's different... There's one stage on Qingdao, one stage on Jinan. And I think this video he's talking about is their speech on Qingdao. Yes, and uh, Chen Weiting is uh, making a um, making a joke on himself, saying that uh, he is uh, getting more and more like Ma Ying <laughs> Of course, you hear about all this complaint about this uh, 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 decision making problem, and uh, I I I think that's actually a problem because um, 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 who, like I say. Um, it's your strategy is looking for a, a, a next better uh, DPP. I, um, who can you trust? And um, you, you never know. If, you, if your attitude is always like this, to looking for someone to uh, replace you, represent, uh, re replace. represent <coughs> you better. Okay? If your attitude is always like this, then I, I, don't, I think it doesn't work. It's, it, the the, the anxious is always there if your attitude is like this. And um, what we are trying to do is uh, the, the other way around. It's like, um, uh, for me, I think for democracy and the politics for everyone is uh, have different meaning. But for me, the most important uh, two things is uh, about if you want to participate in decision making, about how, if you want to use your the power, and uh, another thing is, uh, if you want to take full responsibility of your decision, but um, as I say, I think this is very difficult for uh, uh, how do you, a mature people, a mature politician, okay, a mature citizen. It's a, it's a difficult. It's a, uh, totally against their normal rationality. The normal people will say, okay, I will vote for you. You do the decision for me. And then when there is something wrong, then it's all your fault. Okay? The, for the normal people, they will do things like this. But I think if uh, we don't change this mentality, then um, Chen Weiting, I think Chen Weiting's worry is uh, he, he, 他是对的, 他讲这个是, because in all these uh, years we 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 talk we, we made a lot of negotiation with uh, Kuomintang, Mingjintang and the third party and um, and uh, but um, I said they are yes they 
they can help you to a certain extent. But uh, um, the, the real thing is that if, uh, if uh, you have to know that uh, uh, the power, you, want, you have to, 你要知道说，如果你不把做政治的权利拿在手上的话，那如果你永远只是要去找， if you all always are looking for someone to represent you, then uh, one day something will different go wrong. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been on. First again, um, uh, China Factor. What, what, as a journalist, what motivated me to pay attention to Sunflower and what came before it? Um, well, as I said, I had spent most of my career as a journalist looking at uh, military balance of power in the Taiwan Strait, uh, and became as the Chinese military became stronger and stronger, and the Taiwanese military was stalled for a long time. Uh, it still became obvious that using the military option against Taiwan is the last resort. This is not what the Chinese government wants to do. The consequences would be far too costly and it would not be a walk in the park. It is still something extremely dangerous uh, for the Chinese government. So once you realize that this is their last strategy, well then their, their preferred options are to find different means to take over Taiwan and to undermine its democratic institutions. And this is when I realized that cross-trade services trade agreement were part of a united front campaign against Taiwan to try to weaken it from, from the inside and forcing the Ma Ingzhou administration to adopt policies or means that were rather undemocratic. And you see the takeover of Taiwanese media, the influence of money, influence of banks, investors in Taiwan and in China. So for me, the, uh, the China factor was, uh, was actually a major factor in, in my decision to start paying more attention to social movements and their clash with a the KMT government, but also that mm -hmm. Chinese specter behind it, if you will. Uh, second question, elderly. I've spoken with elderly. I just came back from a conference in Houston at Asia Society. Uh, it was a Taiwan Heritage Week or something. And I uh, had a chance on the following day to speak with the local Taiwanese American community. And most of them uh, would have moved it to the United States in the 70s and 1980s. And they come back every now and then. A lot of them were involved in the Formosa Association for Public Affairs. And they tried to do uh, certain things for, for Taiwan. And um, there were so many of them after my, my talk, they came over and they're like, you know what, Michael? I had given up on Taiwan. 
for so many years we tried to do things, we tried to change things, and we realized it's just only getting worse and worse and worse. And now with Mind Joe and China and all that, they said I had I had given up on Taiwan. And then the Sunflower Movement occurred. Uh, for most of them, it was a surprise because, as I said, they were not getting the information that they needed. But now they're like. I'm full of energy again, and you have people in their in their in their 70s and their 80s, and they're like, you know what? What, my, what can I do now? What I want to I want to help. I want, and we really need to have younger people in government, and we now we really need to start listening to the younger Taiwanese Americans who we've been for the most part ignoring for the past 20 years, right? So I've seen this re-energizing of, of different generations of Taiwanese as well, both within Taiwan and, and overseas. So I think this is quite extraordinary as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and to answer that, sorry, the out. <laughs> yes, I think um, this is not, I think Sunflower Movement is not just a student movement. Like, I talk to a lot of elderly, elderly people there. One, he's a mainlander from, and he's like 85. 85 or something mm -hmm. and there's another one he's really amazing he said like if it's at my time this like the revolution is the only thing we need to do <laughs> and it's for the mind job government let's just do a revolution I was like okay but you know um, for 85, me 80, 85 years old, old man, man. Say, saying that he wants yeah, to have a revolution do, yeah <laughs> okay. let's do that like revolution how can you stand this situation let's have a revolution I was like no uh, for me I prefer I, w I do want a revolution but I prefer to do it in another way like I want everyone do know what what they're going to pay for this mm. I don't just want like a revolution and with passion I want something we can constantly and for long term and change the system. That's why we were saying like we want everyone can be the master of their self and can be the master of their rights and can be the master of this government. And for me, in a way, that's another kind of revolution. That's how I respond to him. But for me, it's like, okay, I, I know you are so, you are more energetic and more passionate than I am now. I recently went back to Taiwan uh, for a visit, and I uh, met up with a couple of, of, of quite a few friends of my generation. Uh, my generation means um, we have our education uh, entirely under the martial law. Mm. So, and inevitably, the topic we, we started to talk about different things. You know, people's life. Mm. Inevitably, the some uh, topic come up immediately, and all of us agree that it is about China. From, my, from our generation's point, it is about China. Um, and in fact, you can see from that survey, uh, this gentleman did about that Taiwan identification or something. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. That you can see that 2013, there's only 1.1 percent of people who think they are Chinese, whereas you know 1992, where it's about three or four years after the martial law era, that's only about, uh, that's about 23.4. something that we would never dream of that would happen in from, from our generation. Mm. And it is historical also about a relationship between family and children that the children don't listen to their parents anymore. If they were going to go ahead and do it, they don't feel embarrassed. Whereas for my generation, we would think, oh, my parents would be so embarrassed that my, mm. my, my children went out to go to the street and do these sort of thing. So it is also the rebellion about family and children as well. Also, um, the conclusion is um, the Sunflower students, they are a total, total new generation. Um, mind your, people of my age generation, they wouldn't understand that. It's just a total, total new way of thinking, a, new, a total new way. Um, so I would say, for my generation's point of view, it is about China. And it is about the threat from China. And the, the, the best things come out of this get together is that um, we think my generation is a luckier because we um, we have uh, got away with the war with um, the Second World War, which my parents would have gone experience. But we are also luckiest because we avoid the war with China, which is the some our generation will be facing. So, so I personally think our generation is thinking yeah. about China. <laughs> Yeah, and then I know Wame wants to come in. Yeah, 
Let me answer this uh, question very briefly. Although I was the one who analyzes, who analyzes this uh, China factor, I have to emphasize that for many young people who participated in this this movement, China factor is not the only or not mm -hmm. the the most important factor mm -hmm. that influenced their participation or involvement in this movement. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what we call generational injustice, yeah. that the older generation owe the younger generation a lot mm -hmm. because of various reasons, is the most important motivation for them to get involved in this movement. China factor is a background factor. Okay, it's a background factor. It's important, but may not be the most important factor. And, and uh, another thing is that, okay, I'm old, but not that old, but old enough. <laughs> Because a lot of my friends, uh, uh, after the Sunflower Movement called me or write FB or email to me <coughs> and say, so Jen, we know that you're heavily involved. Can we have a meeting? You know, those friends that haven't met me for 20 years, they're not going to a meeting. Okay, I say, okay, let's have a meeting. I don't want to go because there, there's very little overlapping b between me and them, you know. And mm. we, we, I don't want to talk to them. You know, they are, they're rich people. <laughs> they're rich people. <laughs> to be honest with you, okay? There's very little overlapping between my lifestyle and their my lifestyle. But I, I went anyway. I went anyway. So eventually I understood why they, they want to talk to me because they don't, they don't understand their children <laughs> who participated in this movement. They want me to help them to understand their children. <laughs> I was with their children on the street. How can I help them? <laughs> Truly, eventually, you know, <laughs> the dinner ended with I quarreling with them. I quarrel with them because they really, I really cannot help them understand what was going on. They didn't change their mind. You know, this is as I, I totally agree with this lady. There's a new context coming up. New context. Uh, 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 from the new gener political generation, a new political generation has been created by this movement. But actually, not only by this movement, through the many multiple movements, as we, as we said, in these recent years, a new political generation has been born. <coughs> a new political discourse has been born, has been created. So the older generation is really difficult for them to understand. But I'm not talking about all of them. A lot of old people still come to the movement mm -hmm. to support whatever support they, they think they think they can give. Yeah. Still a lot, you know, <clears throat> like old, old granny or, or uh, grandfather, they cook something, they offer <laughs> it, you know, things like this happen a lot. So uh, that, that was also really touching, but, but for some of the old generation, not that old generation, I think it has nothing to do with old, it has to do with the political, no, not mm -hmm. economic and social status. Uh, we've got uh, Huawei and, and Dee. Um, okay, one more. So let's take those three questions and then. Okay, okay yeah. Yes, uh, why don't you respond to the first question and the first one and from the ladies? I think uh, for me, I, as, a, as an activist, I think we have a very strong belief in organization. Mm -hmm. you, what you have to do, I mean, in future, how we can do this, um, this organization.
encourage more people to engage in whatever kinds of uh, social organization. Uh, this is the first point. So the second point is, and we do, we did discuss, we do uh, still now discuss a lot about how to form a new progressive third uh, political firm. And this will, will involve many, uh, we hope to involve more, oh sorry, I, I'm from Green Card as well. <laughs> and we hope, we hope to involve more people to think about how can we uh, participate, how can we intervene in the in current uh, political party politics. So uh, the way we do is, is actually before uh, some problem movement, although we are very small, but we try to host more like workshop and uh, consensus meetings. And we believe this is the only way we can find more people they, they are willing to engage into all these kinds of uh, uh, activities to make the to make change in, in, in current political system. And another question, this is my answer to the, the, the lady there. Another question is uh, about uh, Isabel mentioned that it seems we we talk more about strategies. And I was said I see this uh, process is uh, for, uh, I think it's quite similar to the anti-nuclear uh, anti movement after the Fukushima disaster. You see, in Taiwanese society, so many people they start to self-educate themselves. Mm -hmm. You see, so many people they start to, to try to find what, what exactly is the what, what's the exact problem of nuclear power. And what exactly the impact of this kind of energy <laughs> uh, generation system? And I think it's quite similar in Fuma, in anti uh, uh, free travel service industry, cross uh, uh, cross uh, 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 stress. And you can see uh, many people, including many students. It's hard to believe you see they, they work so hard try to find what's the problem of this. They can work so uh, hard, it's a question. Yeah, they, 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 <laughs> they, are not, they won't study so hard <laughs> in, in their own class and in their own courses. And in my university, I come from Zhongshan University, you see many uh, students today from like engineering or from, uh, we have an uh, ocean study college. They, they, this was, I think this is like their first time they try to real uh, engage in an issue and they are never familiar with and also they have no interest in, in the past they have no interest in, in know too much about how, uh, how the political system really operates mm -hmm. in legislative mm -hmm. is but this kind of trying to, to explore the whole political procedure. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's we have, I feel it's, a, it's kind of a, a new new way. People, people know you have to educate yourself and, and with your friends and with some uh, fr friends you don't know from the internet. So, and also during the movement, you see we have like, uh, uh, we all, uh, we think we all have, we, we don't, I think it was in 19th March, we, in the 9th, uh, or 19th, we, we don't, uh, uh, democratic classroom, in street, we start hold a kind of classroom, and you find a student, they, they translate all our speech and put on the website. And also, and later, uh, we have uh, for uh, some, I think, 
they adopt the uh, deliberative uh, democracy and industry. They recruit many people, more than 1,000 people in the street and use the method of deliberative democracy to discuss this trade uh, uh, agreement. What's the problem of this agreement? From very, very different uh, perspective and, uh, and very, very different uh, different impact to like health, to health, to education, to uh, different different industry, uh, amongst the service industry. So I mean, um, this uh, is kind of cool. Okay. I think that's how people get to know what is China Tech. Students alone is not going are not going to support this uh, occupy, occupation action because actually they got a lot of help from from NGOs from uh, regular citizens. But still, nevertheless, I think there's an important element here that in Taiwan's culture, only students have the legitimacy yeah. to do something <laughs> that is that all students seem to be a, a sort of being above interest. So what they do is it, it's like uh, uh, it's like for the national. Uh, interest, so they are not selfish, and that's that's why they have the mm. the power to represent the whole society. I I think it's not so different from from wildly movement. When at that time you you have to have a student ID in order to enter uh, yes. the, the area that is cordon off. <coughs> it, it, that is also the same situation with uh, wild strawberry in two thousand eight. But here I think the students are kind of more relaxed. They allow other people to participate, but even less, nevertheless, they still are, I think, the recognized leadership. So I would say that this is a student-led movement. Well, you may say that there's a new definition of student movement here in Taiwan with the wild, with, with the, 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 the small sun sun Yeah, thank you. Can I follow the, can we follow the order? Yes. So I'm afraid maybe after the two professors, I can have nothing to say. No, no, no. Uh, 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 as our report, you you may see there are so many different kind of person, yeah, involved this uh, sunflower movement, and then of course uh, I I think about this is not just only for the students. I think what the professor her already explained the culture in Taiwan, and then for me I, I I do feel there are different kind of generation in this movement involved this movement. For example, Xiao Ta mentioned about 85 years old. The, the, the grandfather, the Ye Ye from mainland China. And then I also met a lot of, maybe whole their life, they always <coughs> insist Taiwan independent. This kind of 70 or 80, even 90, 90 years old, the, the, the totally Taiwanese, for example, Shi Ming. Huh? Oh. And also, and also you, I, I, I need to special mention, you also can see there are so many, many people they are homeless person, or they are they are much the person in this society. Actually, they feel very happy during this kind of street protest because like they, they find out so many people company them sleep on the street, and then we can see them all around. And sometimes people will just ignore them 
but I, I really find out there is another kind of different place that they feel like home. And also another another group is uh, when, this is something related to the China factor because um, the, I feel the China, China is one of the factor only. And then, but during this movement, you can see they, a lot of actually in Taiwan we have more than three hundred thousand spouses from mainland China, and then some of them actually do present in this movement. But they just keep silent. They afraid to speak out. They afraid the participant will find out. Ah, oh, you are from China, and then I always ask them why, because they all can feel this kind of anti-Chinese, this kind of phenomenon. But they always mention to me. They say, actually, we also like you against this kind of Taiwan government. Just like we also against uh, the Chinese government, sometimes they just only didn't give them 100% freedom. But we're afraid to speak out. But actually, you need to know what we need to against this, is this kind of China uh, capitals, the large China capital. But sometimes they're afraid to speak out during this kind of sunflower movement because they're afraid they became the enemy of the Taiwanese. Mm -hmm. So I think about we really need to use another way to thinking about this social movement. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Fanny, would you like to reply or should we take another couple of questions? You mean before or after? Yeah, would you like to go first? Okay. Yeah. So I can say yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm totally confused. Yeah, I, I would say, of course, it's a, a social movement. But uh, uh, I would say from my observation precisely, I will say it's a youth movement supported by social movement group. Mm -hmm. uh, why did I say so, you know? Uh, because, you know, uh, each time when I have the chance to, to be the speaker, for example, to, uh, to conduct the so-called open space uh, discussion technique or to uh, chair the uh, deliberative democracy on the street, I always starting with a survey, you know, could you tell me where you come from, the south or north? Or you know we call the Wan Dian Ming or Zhao Dian Ming, oh, because mm. it's a classroom, right? <laughs> and some and usually I will also do the age survey. Mm. So from my you know limited experience, I found that actually if you look at the demographic profile, 80 percent of the uh, the participants they are under 30. Of course we have the 85 years old or the 50 years old, but actually the majority they are under 30. So actually they are the core of the mass. So I would say it's a Youth movement, but support it. In terms of the hard work, most of the lots of the 80% of the hard work actually are done by the NGO. You can imagine, right? Yeah, yeah so, okay, the hard work. But you know, uh, I think the media they only recognize the student movement, and the student movement, in terms of history or in terms of the image, I think I don't know why they just have the privilege. Mm -hmm. So, you know, sometimes you know, when the NGO people uh, in the press conference, but you look at the TV, we say the student A, student B, but they are not students. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But they, I mean, they might be the same age. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. So it's a pity that the social movement didn't really get the credit. But I would say that's due to the, well, anyway, the societies, uh, they, they give, you know, high regard to the student and we didn't have the good chance to correct that. Mm. But I would say actually it's a youth movement supported by the social movement. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay, we've got two questions oh. there. Um, oh. We're, oh. Oh, oh, oh yeah, we're getting more and more. But I know you've been waiting quite a long time and then Mike was next. So I said Mike. I think she was just slightly ahead of you. Okay. <laughs> Becoming a more vibrant civil society, are we risking ourselves? 
So I'm going to take uh, a, a mic to work next. Um, just a few words. It happened that I was there on the 30th, the day after I arrived back in Taiwan. And uh, the curiosity is that in the latest uh, FAPA bulletin, there's quite a long piece which says a British visitor who just happened to be there. And that was me. Uh, anyway, I wanted to say something about the, uh, the age distribution. I think there's a tendency to and has been in the, in the discussion to differentiate uh, the old and the young. Now, my impression was there was an extraordinarily uniform age distribution. Uh, and look at the numbers. There's about 500,000 there. They're not enough students to be more than a, small, a smallish percentage. Uh, and it was quite extraordinary that there would seem to be a, a very uniform distribution of social class, age, and um, basic education as well, and, and a certain enthusiasm which went across the whole spectrum of the place, and it was very exciting to be there, trapped in the crowd. Yeah. Okay, thanks. So we've got a couple of uh, points there. One is kind of challenging the, uh, uh, the youth-centred uh, argument, uh, and one on democracy and populism. Yeah, it can be... I'm saying about the populism. I think populism only happens in the society where the society is not active. active. When the people are in the kind of, you know, and used to be mobilized, they don't have really political knowledge, political debates, political culture. And so I think this is more important thing from my point of view in the democratization or democratic consolidation in Taiwan. Now, because we are facing a very critical moment, which is the the re recovering back KMT, which we thought should be changed a little bit after they're failing you know, the, 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 the regime for eight years. But we found that after they come back, the way they deal with the civil society, the, the freedom of speech, and uh, actually is quite similar to what they did in some 20 years ago, even worse than that. Or they used the police police and the state force. So I think this is quite critical moment. We, we, the society now should use this opportunity to, to equip themselves, to improve the kind of, you know, different kind of knowledge and uh, become active to ensure what we got in terms of democracy. And uh, of course, for the next agenda would be, you know, the, the relations with China or the social equality, that kind of things. But um, if you want to say something about the democracy or democratic consolidation, I think a very important thing is to, you know, more active, activate the different kind of, different corners, different areas, people, to concern about more about public <coughs> issues. So that there won't be no chance for the politician in the future if they are smart enough, try to be populist. Okay, so that's I think it is quite quite tricky things um, because the, the the basic knowledge is that um, if the, there is a passive society, it would be uh, um, easy to become populist. But if we have been activated around different corners, different class, different communities, I think that we can avoid the kind of possibilities. Um, yeah, I can see you then. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to um, um, echo Professor Cho's um, sentiment. Um, I am political science scientist by training, and um, the reason why I, start, um, I started monitoring the social movement in Taiwan is because I was interested in the consolidation process of democracy of Taiwan and then the quality of democracy of Taiwan. And so if you look at, if you examine the literature within the con, um, democratic consolidation, there is some, um, I, I, I do believe that Taiwan is still in the process of consolidating um, <clears throat> its democracy because if you, if you look at consolidation literature within political science, there's um, a few criteria that you will, you will see. Um, not only that rule of law has to be respected, 
and there's a general consensus within society that the society operates as a democracy. And also there's two more important um, factor is um, that you need an active and vibrant civil society and, and um, individuals who are in in sync in definition of social and political rights. And you see that in Taiwan right now. And then you see the student movement kind of channeling. Um, um, a lot of us mentioned the 30 seconds um, <laughs> passage of, of, of yeah. the agreement. And I see that, that that was one of one of the key thing is that there's the there's that bottom line that, that will um, activate um, civil society, um, including the students to um, participate in such a movement. So, so um, so for me, looking at the Sunflower Movement, um, I, I, I was not too worried about um, the student movement or, or, or the whole movement in general turning into populism, just a, a bunch of um, individuals being activated just because there's a charismatic leader tell them um, to do something. Um, so so that, that's pretty much um, my opinion when it comes to democracy versus populism and um, from examining from, from the movement's angle. Yes, man. Uh, the, similarity between, the similarity between democracy and uh, populism is that a wide range of citizens uh, or, or a huge amount of citizens uh, participated in certain political events. Right? That's a similarity. From judging from that, you can see, well, this time a lot of a, a huge number of citizens are involved. But what is the difference? The difference is, is that whether these participating citizens are well informed or self educating, or do they come from different walks, different categories, different sectors of the society? If they're uh, terribly similar. I mean, they, are, they, they all have the same face. <laughs> there is, you may have a legitimate doubt that this is very populist. But you know, this time we have, I think, more than 100 NGOs, right? And the NGO, and these NGOs, as I said, it's a miracle that they, they can come together. <laughs> Usually, they don't talk to each other, okay? But right now, they come together for, diff for various reasons, as I presented. There are at least three contact, different contexts. They come together. And uh, during the process, as Fan Yun presented, we never stop educating ourselves, as if this is never enough. Now, I have to tell you, these students, they, I don't know where they, they, they got this spirit of learning. You know? <laughs> they never show that in my class. That they study, I'm telling you, they study the, the, the service trade agreement better than anyone else. I don't know where they get this energy from. Sometimes they ask me questions that I really cannot answer. I have, to, I, I have to say I'm really embarrassed by them. And so, so I have to say these young, particularly the young generations, somehow I see the energy that I don't know what, where that energy comes from. Okay, self-educating, self-motivated. So definitely that's not populism. Uh, okay, yeah. Why? Very briefly, Shut very up. briefly. Well, another thing is speaking of educating. Uh, Another fascinating thing that one saw, especially on, on Jinan Road, is you had all these little uh, libraries yeah, yeah. that emerged during the occupation. And it was fascinating to see young Taiwanese reading Edward Said, reading George Orwell, reading Michel Foucault, <laughs> Chinese translations, original English. Uh, again, as, as, as you said, there's this willingness to learn not just cross-trade services, trade agreement, or Taiwanese history, but also uh, modes of thought from, from outside, right? And uh, there's a reason why a lot of young Taiwanese were reading 1984. Uh, and it's fascinating, there's this, this willingness to learn again. They're not reading manga, they're reading Orwell, they're reading Foucault, they're reading Said. It's extraordinary, yeah. Hi, oh, sorry, can I just, because I want to invite some students down there, because um, I know here's also um, like events here in London, uh, like a protest or something, and it's more than 500 people. She, she told me before it's like 700 people. And I do want to know more about what happened here around the Sunflower Movement yeah. period. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to be on a newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> Show us your stand. Explain my t-shirt? 
This is a gossip. Uh, the t-shirt I'm wearing today is the more than B. Wish that lots of professors have talked about this term. It's uh, based on the cross trade agreement. Uh, we have a group booking and ship the t-shirts from Taiwan to the UK, which is very exciting. So um, I don't really know what I'm supposed to talk today because. I'm not prepared. About, about yeah. the experience of, uh, I mean, uh, you yeah, yeah, and why, like, like what motivates you start doing all those organizing things? Are you guys asking questions? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so who's the first? Uh, uh, firstly, uh, I, I'll give an introduction about what we have How done. Why did so you easy there, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Again, besides the Yes, that's yeah. It'll be great. Yes. Yes. It's a very good place to take pictures. Um, so what we have done on March 30 is that the day was an overseas protest. Uh, there are more than 70 countries, up to 49 cities, Taiwanese students who are now studying in those places, trying to get together to have an overseas huge protest. And we are, uh, me, myself, and my two friends down there were one of the organizers about the, uh, of the protest in London. And on March uh, 30th, I think, I think two professors have shown the pictures in Taiwan. We are very surprisingly to know that Taiwan decided to have a protest on that day too, because actually we have the idea first before them, <laughs> which is uh, very interesting, because when we are trying to get more supporters from overseas, and the last country who joined this protest is Taiwan. Yeah. <laughs> I think we have to, I, ha, I personally really want to make this idea clear, because we don't want to like, uh, yeah, of course we are supporting Taiwan, but you know, the story is like that, not like that. <laughs> and uh, what we have done is we had a huge protest at Trafalgar Square, and there were more than 700 people supporting Amazing. us. Uh, I firstly have to admit that this, that was my first time, like, practically attend in a social movement or in a protest. Because, I, I would like to respond to you, because actually my hometown is Pingtung. <laughs> and Pingtung University of Education is just right next to my house. Okay, good. And when you were showing the pictures of the stories in southern Taiwan, I was quite touched, to be honest, because uh, it's very rare to see like Taiwan people all over the country has finally yeah. devoted themselves in at least one social issue. So I was quite uh, touched. And also, I was pretty touched to see there are a lot, uh, numerous, like hundreds and hundreds of people attending the protest in the UK. And I got lots of feedback, because also questions. One of the most important questions is that, why are you Taiwanese people overseas doing this outside your country? What can you contribute? And to be honest, I have no answer to that. That's the question I want to ask too, like to one of you. What can we do overseas? What Taiwanese people overseas can contribute to our own country, to our homeland? Because as uh, lots of people have mentioned that we have translation in different languages to try to get more like uh, international media's attention. And that's what we want to do too. We contact with lots of local media and try to get more exposure. But apart from that, what can we actually do? Like now, we are sitting here to discuss this social issue in London, but what actually can we get from you? Or what can we contribute? That's my question. Maybe one thing I would respond to that, one of the big lessons I think we've learned from uh, this last two and a half days is the, the important role that returning Taiwanese, uh, returning students have. I mean, for example, if we turn on things when we're talking about the Korean social movement scene, a big factor is return students. Uh, so I would, I would underestimate the uh, uh, the role yeah. of the yeah. um, and the fact that, for example, um, uh, the Taiwanese government is so concerned about some of the overseas uh, student movements. So, uh, I don't know whether anyone else wanted to follow up on, on what they can do. But apart from, uh, maybe, uh, before that, maybe you wanted to say a little bit about the the uh, June 28th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th thanks for giving this opportunity here. Yeah. That it would be very beneficial for us. And actually after the protest on March 30th, lots of, uh, lots of students, not just students, like overseas Taiwanese people in Japan, in Germany, we are again organizing lots of like following activities. And in terms of the, uh, London, we are going to have a conference like this today 
on 20th of June. And we have already invited lots of speakers. And one, yeah, Zafi Feld, yes, he's coming too. Good. It's our honor. And also Huang Guochang, Laoshi, he's coming to London on 28th of June. And he's going to give a speech. And also a uh, professor from uh, LSE, uh, Arthur Busan, I don't know if you know him. And a uh, professor from Taiwan University, uh, Wu, Wu Taoming, is going to have a talk about economics and cross trade uh, agreement. So we would like to invite you to come again because I think it will be very meaningful. And also, not only Taiwanese students here are doing something, we have a Hong Kongese students organizing yeah. some a protest well, too. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> uh, as, as, as I guess, because uh, in, in June uh, there, there are so many things happening in Hong Kong. Yeah. First, the, 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 the Chinese government yeah. issued a white paper about the position of Hong Kong. That's that's the, the technically speaking, is they say that they they claim over the the, the, the control and sovereignty of Hong Kong, and, and at the same time, there uh, in, the, in the internal level, of, in the domestic level of Hong Kong, the 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 Hong Kong government and, and, and the developers is, is trying to to evict a lot of people in, in northeast Hong Kong mm. in order to 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 develop to do those luxury apartments. And and last week uh, there, 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 there was there was a huge protest outside the, the Legislative yeah. Council. And this week, uh, because that the, 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 the the, the government is asking for budget and, and, and they, they will go, go again in the Legislative Council and, and nowadays the, the, the Legislative Council is already putting all those spades and, and, and trying to forestall people to, to protest. So uh, on the coming Saturday, uh, 2 p.m., outside Tate Modern, mm. uh, we'll have a, we'll a sit-in. And, and the title of sit-in is Dignity at 4 a.m., which is inspired by... by <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, did anyone want to respond? I mean, um, or should we take a, a final couple of questions? Have we got one, two, three? Okay. Oh, well, we've got about five questions. So, uh, um, would you like to? Maybe we should take take them all, maybe as more as, as comments, perhaps, than a question. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. I keep them yeah, fairly short. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Right. Just a quick question. Uh, I am an active citizen from Hong Kong. Um, so um, after the, the sharing, uh, I've seen a, a vast similarity between the situation in Hong Kong and, and Taiwan, especially when you mentioned about uh, the uh, social movements, especially the, the sunflower, I, can, I would compare the sunflower movement with uh, the anti-national education movement mm -hmm. uh, in happening in mm -hmm. Hong Kong, which also end, uh, results after a series of uh, uh, social movements, for example, the demolition of the Prince Pier, mm. uh, um, the destruction of the village uh, due to the recent due to the development of mm. the express railway in, in, in Hong Kong. Mm. So um, my question is, um, since we're sharing this, uh, these similarities, and we also have a new generation, um, new political generation, we have social movements led by uh, um, young uh, youth groups, say for example, scholarism. And we might have uh, an occupation uh, uh, movement called Occupy Central in Hong mm. Kong. It might or might not happen, I don't know. Uh, it may be amplified by the China, China factor or the, the white paper currently occurred. And we also have the uh, uh, Northeast development as mentioned by the mm. gentleman. So, for you guys, uh, we are actually panicking as Hong Kongers. We are worrying. Um, do you have any advice for us? Advice. <laughs> <laughs> we do not have. Um, we do not have a sea. We don't have a border. We don't. We don't even have an army. And we are already a part of China. The Chinese factor is probably the most worrying, biggest factor um, in in our city. So, um, in that case, in the future context, what's coming next uh, for the success of social movement and fighting for social justice? What's your Suggestion. Okay, I mean, um, um, okay, let's take the other one. Alan, you had a question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in regards to the West and of uh, the carpet of the situation in Taiwan, uh, I was wondering, could it be like, I mean, you know, they 
talk a lot about what's happening in Syria because they have a vested interest in wanting to change the regime over there, but they don't talk about that ring because they want to keep the status quo. Um, could it be that they actually, like, well, what is America's opinion on it? Do, do they just want to keep the status quo because it's peaceful and they want to have a good relationship between Taiwan and China uh, and they don't want to rock the boat? Or well, how, how, do they, how do they feel basically is my question. Where does America stand? Thanks, yeah. I just want to ask you, uh, what would you say to Chinese people if you meet them about, <laughs> about this movement? Because there is actually an occasion next Monday uh, at UCL. There's a China-Taiwan cross-strait debate. And uh, um, I, I, I know about this event because I joined an interview in my department at UCL. And uh, there's an interview for uh, new lectures. And the, the, this was a, a um, Chinese candidate uh, presenting his uh, uh, research in um, uh, diaspora literature. And when when he left, when she left that uh, um, podium, um, uh, we PhD, uh, PhD students as audience are asked about uh, our opinions. And I, I, I say maybe I'm Taiwanese. I when when she was presenting, there's always a, uh, a question in my mind. Why is Chinese diaspora? And and next to me was the, uh, Dr. Vivian Luo. He, she is the um, the director of Chinese health and health and uh, humanity. humanity. Um, yes, and, and she, she invited me to talk about this uh, the movement to Chinese students, her Chinese students. And I, I think this is very important that we have better communication with Chinese students because they are not, not necessarily charged with the, the, this governmental uh, ideology. And so maybe at, at this occasion, I just want to invite you to there if uh, you are interested. And I, I'm also aware that we are, maybe we need to be very careful in our wording and uh, have a good communication skills. So <laughs> and the big question is, uh, um, what would you say uh, to Jessica? Is that directly in response? Directly okay, go on, yeah. I'm organizing and then she went next. Yeah. On Monday. Uh, <laughs> and I'll try and say something about that at the end of the presentation if there was time. Um, we've actually been, like, to address that question before, we've been having real difficulty getting mainland states to attend. Um, <laughs> 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 which one would be interested in coming? Um, that would be really wonderful. And if anyone would like more information, please come and talk to me afterwards. And about it. Sorry, yeah, please come on Monday. Okay, and, and Chi Man, you're going to have the last uh, question. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay yeah. Follow up the Hong Kong okay. questions, and then um, because actually I'm, I'm half Taiwanese, half Hong Kong, so I yeah, have many mixed feelings in between. And then I was very glad that I can join the con conference each today, and then I listened to your your wonderful presentation. I learned a lot from this, and then and I remember when we are having lunch together today. It's like we are talking about maybe the PRC is doing like the great thing they do is like. Pushing all the Taiwanese and Hong Kong people together. <laughs> yeah, and then, and then for, for me, it's, I, I, I was a bit touching because um, when I see what happened in Taiwan, actually many Hong Kong young people actually they, they first support the uh, some far movement and the many journalists and then actually they be on the, okay on the surface they they should be like uh, didn't have many emotion but but behind the scene we talk about that everyone is saying that it's so we are so happy to see it something happened in Taiwan and in Hong Kong because um, and then recently Hong Kong happened so many things and then we are I agree we are very worried about it and then but in the same time actually I feel very touched because I actually been before I didn't really feel like many Taiwanese I always go back to Taiwan every year two to three times and then I didn't really feel like Taiwanese people really um, um, concerned about the situation in Hong Kong that much and then recently and then I can see many support from Facebook, and then it's, it's very touched, and then I think two places get closer and closer together. Yeah, and I mean, one thing I've added my, to that is, my, I mean, I've been to so many town conferences over the last decade or so, this is probably the, the one conference where Hong Kong has come up more than ever, <laughs> which uh, I think the, the links are becoming much, much closer. I think it's a really interesting. Um, but uh, I, just, I, I, I know... Steve, I one who's wrote the question, like my question actually is, do you think... Um, other than what Hong Kong can do, is like because we, I think the same is Hong Kong people actually feeling feel the feeling that it's the same as Taiwanese people is that government is not working, the legislative council actually is not working. So the only way they, they are going to protest like Occupy Central and then I think maybe they, it's the only thing we can do because we actually in a situation back, really bad.
and further than in Taiwan because we don't have democracy and then we can't vote. So um, the only thing is that we can do is like strict, co strict protests or to become more violent. I, I, I see violent is not a bad word, but it's mm. like, is it the only thing we can do? Okay, I mean, on, on that point then, I think we're going to have to uh, uh, to finish. Let me just, uh, I think we should uh, thank the, the panel. Uh, <laughs> I think we'd like to uh, thank all of you for your contributions. Yeah.